I'll call the April 8th Planning Commission meeting to order. Will Commissioner Klaustermeyer, will you lead us in our pledge, please? Yes. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, staff, roll call, please. All commissioners present this evening. Great, thank you. Public comments, this is the time we take public comments on items that are not on the agenda that are generally within the purview of the Planning Commission. If you wish to speak, please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Also, please call 949-270-8165 to provide public comments on non-agenda items. First, I'll go to uh, Mr. Mosier. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Weigand, members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Jim Mosier. As I believe all of you have noticed many times, every staff report that you get up in the subject line has a, a reference to a PA number related to the project, as does the tentative agenda of upcoming items. Uh, those numbers relate to the what is called the case log that is online. And I wanted to compliment the city staff, I think intentionally, on improving the case log since I last looked at it. It used to just tell you that an application had been filed, but recently they have added links that one can cl click on those if you put in the PA number in the case log, and the link will take you to uh, a considerable amount of the laser fish information, the actual application, correspondence, and so forth that is received regarding the application. I think it's intentional that that has been made publicly visible, and I think it's a very good thing. Uh, it gives us a little more advanced information about what is coming up. The second comment may be a, a little more technical and maybe too technical. Um, these meetings also are archived in the laser fish system of the city. And formerly, like the city council meetings, they used to be archived in a format where people could link to an individual page from minutes or a staff report or so forth or download pieces by request. And I noticed for the last year, everything from this commission has been archived there as a single large PDF file, which has certain advantages. The links that were in it work, but you cannot download selectively pieces of it. So if it's a thousand page staff report, you either have to download none of it or all of it. So it would be really nice if, if the staff could work out a way both, both A, a way that both the links worked and you could view individual pages, which they seem to have some difficulty with. Anyway, the final comment I want to make is totally unrelated to this. Uh, I know you're very interested as a planning commission in controlling planning in the city. And if you had not heard about this, somebody alerted me last week in the legislature in Sacramento, two democratic legislators have introduced a constitutional amendment uh, for the next general election ballot called ACA 7 that would restore local control to cities and especially charter cities and make their local planning ordinances supreme over state law in all respects except for the Coastal Act, siting of power plants, and the location of water and transportation infrastructure. I'm generally pretty lukewarm about the city taking a position on pending legislation. The sponsors of this, at least one of them, has a pretty good record of getting their bills through the legislature. So I am, I am hoping that our city will be supporting that and people will have a chance to vote on it in some upcoming election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. I like that idea a lot. Okay, uh, community room. Are we still taking or are we uh, allowing in here only? I see our camera, but I just wanted to make sure that. We're doing both. Okay. Okay, and then are, do we have anyone on the phones? Okay, great. I'll move on to our next item, request for continuances. Staff, are there any? Uh, Mr. Chair, there are no requests for continuances. Okay, consent items. Item number one is the minutes from the March 18th, 2021 meeting. Um, I did re recall seeing some uh, edits from Mr. Mosier. And again, if you would like to comment on this, again, it's 
270-8165. Any questions from the commission? And anyone in the public? Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes with Mr. Mosher's edits. Great, thank you. Second, please. I'll second. Okay, all right, we'll call for the vote. Hand vote. Is that a yes? The motion carries unanimously. Okay, great. We'll move on to our public hearing items. Item number two is mixed use Dover Westcliff MUDW Zoning District Code Amendment PA 2020 316. Site location is the mixed use Dover slash Westcliff Zoning District and it's come comprised of six parcels located along the westerly side of Dover Drive between 16th Street and West Cliff Drive. Um, Commissioner Lowry? Yeah, um, I'll have to recuse myself. A uh, business partner has uh, owns one of the properties that this would affect. Great, thank you. We'll give you the boot and send you in the back. Again, if you would wish to comment on this item and you're listening on uh, your TV, it's 949-270-8165. Staff, uh, please proceed with your presentation. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Jocelyn Perez I'm with the planning division and the item in front of you is a code amendment to allow eating and drinking establishments, also known as restaurants and larger health and fitness facilities, also known as gyms within the mixed use Dover Westcliff zoning district. The MUDW is located along Dover Drive between West Cliff Drive and 16th Street. It consists of six properties that are primarily developed with multi-tenant office buildings with the exception of one religious institution located at the intersection of 16th Street and Dover Drive. The surrounding land uses are primarily residential. There's a park and no, uh, a high school, as well as a strip along West Cliff Drive of commercial land uses, which include medical offices, beauty salon, and restaurants. The MUDW, prior to the most recent general plan update, had the zoning designation of APF, or Administrative Professional and Financial, which notably allowed, conditionally allowed eating and drinking establishments and health and fitness facilities. When it was rezoned to MUDW, those uses were omitted. In late 2020, property owners within the MUDW district approached the city expressing a difficulty with leasing vacant office space. They suggested that the ability to lease the space as either restaurants or gyms could help them with filling the vacant space. City Council Member Duffield understood and agreed with them and requested that the City Council consider adopting a resolution to initiate a code amendment. In November, the City Council adopted that resolution initiating the code amendment. In front of you, in front of you now is the table two dash eight eight, which shows the allowed uses within the MUDW district. The code amendment would allow the restaurants and gyms subject to approval of a use permit. Appro uh, so any time an applicant would like to open a new restaurant or gym, they would be required to file an application for a use permit which allows a case-by-case -case evaluation of whether that business would be compatible with the surrounding uses as well as whether there's available parking on site. Notably, this code amendment does not alter off-street parking ratios. So it's not going to decrease the 
the need for parking on site. Staff evaluated these additional uses for consistency with, a gen with the general plan. There's a thorough analysis on handwritten page six in the staff report, but these are the, the land use categories, policies, and guidelines that staff used and found the new uses to be consistent with the general plan. Staff is recommending conducting a public hearing and finding the project exempt from CEQA and adopting the resolution to recommend that the city council approve the zoning code amendment. Staff notified surrounding property owners within a 300 foot radius of the MUDW block. Also, a notice was posted in the daily pilot and staff sent a letter to property owners prior to uh, this hearing requesting feedback on the zoning code amendment. As of today, no response has been received from the property owners within the mixed use district. Are there any questions? Great, thank you so much. I'll open it up to the commissioners. Commissioner Kenning. <laughs> How did you know? Um, I'm curious, it, it makes sense to me, but will, will there be a restriction on hours of operation, especially with, when we're dealing with food operations? Commissioner Ketting, the, the, the proposed amendment doesn't include any hours of operation, so we would be treating this as we would any other restaurant or a gym uh, in any other zone. So it, the, it would require a minor use permit or a conditional use permit depending upon the conditions. And at that point in time, we would evaluate the hours of operation to see if we can make sure it's compatible with the surrounding area. All right. My other question, well, there's two. Uh, would a fast food restaurant be allowed with drive through Potentially, yes. It would be require a conditional use permit. Okay. Same thing. Go through the drill. All right. Uh, I'm just concerned because there's a vast number of people living in apartments right behind it and across the street. Lastly, parking ratios. It says it'll be done by standards, which is perfect. But that may be mean less square footage of a restaurant, et cetera, because they're in an office zone now, mo mostly, in a church. So that could be, I guess they have to deal with that, you know. They're individual, or six parcels, right? They have to fit it on, if it meet the code. Is that what I'm asking? Yes, there would uh, okay. most likely be an increased parking requirement based on the size of the food use, and if they did not have, or the gym, and if they did not have that parking on site, um, they would have to seek a parking waiver, which would come to the Planning Commission, okay. or off-site parking. Those are existing procedures of the Municipal Code. And so, uh, again, uh, I wouldn't anticipate a very large facility if it's going to fit within those existing buildings, because um, you're right, the parking might be a constraint. So it might keep them smaller. Yeah, you got to look bigger, though. Could they, they could tear down buildings and put up something. It, yes, they could. That's fine. Thank you. You answered the questions. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Klostermeyer. Yeah, I see that there is a CEQA exemption being used here. Uh, was there any analysis done for traffic? I assume with a different use that there are impacts to traffic in the area. With each new application for a restaurant at that time, the impacts from that application would be analyzed. So no, there was no specific anal um, analysis in this amendment. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Rosine. Just for clarity, is a minor use permit come before the Planning Commission or is that a staff level approval? A minor use permit would be heard by the zoning administrator, but there is the possibility it could be of appeal to the Planning Commission. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just tap on that. So uh, fast food then would be an MUP, right? As long as there was no alcohol or I guess maybe beer and wine, an MUP could be handled. Pardon me, I'm flipping back to the slide with uh, 
fast food, MUP, so in front of the zoning administrator. Gotcha. And Chair Wake, if I may add to and add to um, Commissioner Rosine's question, sometimes from a from a director's level, I can bump up the item to the planning commission. So they're typically the lowest level is the zoning administrator, but sometimes we actually move things up to the planning commission for review. Could staff ask a uh, answer in the in the discussion? There was a little bit mentioned about uh, housing in that in the so if there was mixed use, there was a commercial restaurant, office, gym, whatever down on the first floor. How much housing can exist on the top floor? Um, the, the the current general plan and the zoning allow for up to twenty. 26.7 dwelling units per acre and so and there are no residential uses within this particular zone at this point in time so y you could have that kind of density above the roof uh, excuse me above the commercial spaces there um, and and it, it this zone does require commercial use to be uh, present on the property if you have uh, a mixed-use project you can't have a standalone residential use on this property so could this body limit the residential and only allow for commercial or would that have to be a separate item or is that even allowable since um, the general plan has it already allowed? At, at the moment, commercial is allowed. Um, some uses require use permits. You can do a mixed use building only with uh, some sort of commercial on the ground floor. And then once that building is built, you could have any use that would otherwise be allowed in that zone subject to an MUP or a CUP or an allowed activity. So you could have the whole gamut of uses. Mostly just residential I'm concerned with. Could we limit the residential from this body or is that something that couldn't be? Um, it, that, that's not before the commission tonight. That's not. But could it be in a different? Uh, agenda item potentially it could be I, I guess I'd ask the question are we trying to limit the residential use if a restaurant is there or a gym is there is that the concern I, yes I, yes and or just in general purposes if they are allowed to redo that center build something new restaurant office space gym and then have housing could we restrict that I'll just add, it, the underlying zoning is a mixed use, which is a combination, so I think you'd actually have to make a, a zone change, a zoning code amendment, in order to change the underlying zoning to get rid of the housing altogether. I guess where I'm going with this is that we have the housing element that we're going to be hearing about next. Those sites were identified as potential areas that we could build housing on, correct? Correct. What would be the difference between today and us approving this versus something that could come out of the housing element and the general plan update in the future. And as far as intensity, as far as residential or standalone residential. Um, well, it's a bit speculative here to see what, what, what the results of the housing element update will be. We are looking at these sites for potentially increased density, um, but we hadn't really thought about modifying the permitted uses as a result of that. You know, we feel that with this recommendation, adding these uses to a mixed use building, whether it's 26 units per acre or 30 or 40 units per acre, we, we believe that it still can be found compatible, uh, the, the principally because we would be looking at these uses on an individualized basis through the minor use permit or the conditional use permit so we can condition it so that it would be compatible. So we, we don't see a distinction between the future housing at the site and what's otherwise allowed today. I mean, my thought is that if you're concerned about these uses in a mixed-use building at this site, then you might not want to endorse this amendment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess with the cart before the horse kind of concept here, if we're going to be talking about housing down the road and these sites were identified, I, I kind of take concern with uh, Commissioner Heading bringing up just the fast food component of it. It's, it's clear. I, I live in that side of town. I drive that street every day. I don't think it's a fast food um, candidate, obviously we have the right here on the commission to appeal a zoning administrator's decision, but, um, I, I think, I think we should at least wait and see. And, and I take, dif uh, you know, no disrespect to Councilman Duffield's interest in this. And I, I do think the buildings there are somewhat dilapidated and, uh, are vacant, but I think the discussion is going to be here very soon as to what the city wants to do, what the council wants to do with housing. And, um, I think there's a, a, a an opportune piece here to add for that into the discussion and then decide down the road, okay, we can have this uh, restaurant gym component, but I think it's a little premature in the discussion, but that's that's where I'm going with it right now. And um, my you know, other commissioners can 
debate that or discuss it, or I can just carry on. And this is a staff driven item, so there's no ex parte communications report, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right, cool. Um, I'll bring it to, uh, to the public hearing and uh, take public comments on this item. So again, if you're watching, uh, phone number is 949-270-8165. And I'll go to the chambers or the community room. I don't see anyone in the community room, but Mr. Mosier. Uh, Chair Weigand, members of the commission, uh, Jim Mosher again. I, I will look forward to your discussion and decision on this. I submitted some uh, written suggestion regarding handwritten page 17, which is the actual ordinance, uh, suggesting it might be simplified and clarified, the paragraph above the table. After doing that, I noticed today that if you went forward with adopting this, whether you used my recommendation or staff's recommendation, it, it needs an addition to it on handwritten page 17. At the top where it says section one, it says the row entitled eating and drinking establishments, bunch of words, is amended to read as follows. But if you look, it's not just the eating and drinking establishments, it's the health and fitness facilities as well. So I think it needs to say rows entitled eating and drinking establishments and health and fitness facilities. Other the, whether, why is the people trying to codify this are gonna find a conflict between what it says in the words at the top and what it shows in the table. So it, it's more than just eating and drinking establishments, it's also health and fitness facilities, rows that are being changed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Anyone else in the Building. Okay, anyone on the phone? Two callers. Okay, you're on. If you can mute your television. Okay. All right, you're up. Oh, I'm live. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I was watching it, so I didn't realize there's a delay. Uh, this is Laura Acuna. I am a property manager with DMP Properties. I am the property manager for 1501 and 1515 West Cliff Drive. Um, with the uncertainties of the current commercial real estate market, and in light of the challenges in dealing with and adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic, I wanted to express my support of the expansion of the MUDW zoning district's uses to conform more closely with those of the neighboring properties. Uh, this would allow opportunities in use and leasing for the MUDW property owners, not only to their benefit, but to that of the neighboring community by potentially providing new dining and fitness amenities to the residents of the Dover Shores and greater Newport Beach community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next caller, please. Okay, you're on. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is David Tanner, Newport Beach resident. Um, I wanted to uh, express my uh, strong disagreement for this project at this time because of the residential uses that are allowed. Because it's mixed use, uh, the future is unknown. Uh, the housing laws are varied and many, and the city can very easily lose control of this property uh, when Mr. Campbell stated it could be 26 units per acre, that doesn't include density bonus, incentives, concessions, and other things. This could be high-rise uh, residential with a very small uh, commercial component. Uh, you just don't know. So it's not appropriate at this time to act on this. I would wait, as uh, Mr. Chairman, you suggested, until uh, the City Council gives further direction on the general plan housing element and how that is going to go. Uh, because we don't need any more mixed use in this city before we have worked out uh, what we're going to do with housing and the impact of housing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other callers? Okay, that's it. I'll close the uh, public hearing, bring it back to the commission for discussion. Commissioner Kleiman. Can we just clarify, as it sits today, if residential 
uh, would be allowed. It, it sounds like there's some confusion up here. I know um, our city attorney tried to clarify, but but if we did nothing um, and the current property owners wanted to get rid of their office or they wanted to, to redevelop in some way, they could do so, correct? Including residential? Commissioner Kleiman, absolutely. Uh, the property owners could redevelop with a commercial building pursuant to the existing zoning with the uses that are presently afforded, although without the amendment, not the uses that we're discussing. But they could also redevelop today with a mixed use building, commercial on the ground floor and residential above. That, that could happen today. Yeah, I think that's somehow being missed up here. The residential is not the new use that we're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I, I think what where I was going on my discussion was more that this was an area that the housing element chose as uh, ripe for uh, future discussion, perhaps an increase in density um, ab above and beyond what exists today. My concern is mostly about you know, throwing a fast food uh, on a, a replacing the LDS church right there, which I don't know if they are the landowner or if they're just a, a tenant of the property. They didn't comment on it. You know, I, I rode my bike there and found all the signs on the ground when I, you know, traveled through there. And uh, shame on me for not picking them up. But my kids were late to school, so. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know if the, the 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 LDS church even would recognize that there's potential for you know, it looked like it shows nightclub on here. I don't know if that's what that what would be, but you know, at least a restaurant or some type of. Uh, you know, type of impact to them. They already have parking troubles uh, on their lot. You know, people coming either from the stadium, from the high school, or um, some of the residential that's over there on Coronado. There's, do we staff, how many units are in that 880 property that's right next to it? Well, it's, it's, it's over 1,450 units. Yeah, that, I mean, that, they, they usually, the lots are, uh, have tow companies that prevent it, but I just, I just I'm more afraid of the cart before the horse on this one. I, I, I think there's more discussion to be had when you have the housing element coming up that's saying that you can have an increase in there. But, you know, this is this is coming from a guy that lives down the road from here. And there's um, a housing track right across the street from there in the castaways that I don't even think these guys are really paying attention to the fact that they could have, you know, a, a restaurant be there. Maybe they would want it. but you know, it could be an impact to them and nobody's really thinking of it. So look, I'm, I'm, I want businesses to thrive in the city. I want uh, to give them opportunities to have um, the other uses that benefit them. I, I, I get the struggle and I get, I just, I don't know if we're just rushing this one a little bit and uh, can pull back and, and, and have this housing discussion first and then see where it goes if they're gonna be discussing that you know, as, as opportune, uh, opportunities for us. So that's just where I'm at, Commissioner, you, yeah, Commissioner Rosen. I'm wondering about intent here because I think a, a restaurant use, a sit-down restaurant use might be a viable opportunity here in the future. It's already happening right around the corner and those areas are thriving as far as I can tell. And I'm wondering if maybe the conversation about fast food is what where this hangout might lie and if we just, eliminated a fast or recommended a, that fast food wasn't an option uh, if that might have more is that something support? staff that could be removed from this discussion at this point oh certainly it's it's up to the the discretion of the planning commission i just remind the plan the chair and the planning commission this is just a recommendation to the city council mm -hmm. so whatever you decide whether to approve deny or amend it'll just be a recommendation to the council yeah i mean there, there's obvious reason why councilman duffield you know has interest in this it's his district and the the, the owners reached out to him look i don't want to restrict owners i want to see their businesses or the land that they own make it valuable for them to have. I just want to make sure that maybe this is the great opportunity for us just to weigh those out so that when council reviews the minutes, they can kind of see or go back on the tape and see, hey, there were these concerns. They can hammer and flesh it out. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that part of it, that it's simply just a recommendation. Commissioner Kenny. All right, two parts. One, the housing element that I read every page is they're basically up in the cloud overlay zone, potential sites. So I don't think we have to be too concerned about that, but we might need it in the future. Number two, you know, we, staff, you write fast food, fast food, fast food, fast food. 
uh, you know, there are restaurants you walk up and you get it and you go home. That's fast. The ones that have a drive through is, are a different animal. So uh, with late night hours, you know, each one of these, I can't figure out which is which. Um, maybe if you put in here with drive through that would focus or we could eliminate that. But for fast food service, you know, that's, that's a funny definition today. That's all. You got, you got to be careful of that. Um, there's a pizza place around the corner down there that has like four seats, and it's mainly fast and out, et cetera. So it's hard. That's a fine line. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think certain areas would work there. But the, if you come down West Cliff to connect to Dover, the, it's not a stop. It's a, you know, whatever that the area right here is where the car washes where we're debating on the, the Shell gas station just over here on right around the corner from here. It's a similar type of drive. And so there's a lot of movement on that street. So the in and out, this, w w you know, how's that all going to be configured? Obviously, that's stuff we'd have to discuss and the council would have to weigh into. But there's some infrastructure that needs to be adjusted there to either slow that traffic down or if there's going to be a lot more, especially if there were these uh, fast food, but not you know, McDonald's fast food, but, you know, in and out, a lot of traffic coming and going, picking up to goes and takeouts. And, and I just, I see there's, there's a reconfig that needs to be done in that area there. And that's way beyond the discussion that we're supposed to have tonight on this. And, you know, I, I'll leave it up to the commission to, to take, Commissioner Klosterman. I think based on the fact that any future projects here require a minor use permit or a conditional use permit that is that could be brought in front of us. I think that gives us the assurance that something that is not compatible with the surrounding area is going to be approved. So I'm, I'm okay with the way that this is drafted and presented. Great. I appreciate those comments. Yeah, I would sort of agree. I, um, I think we're hearing from the property owners that their current use isn't working and, um, that's a reflection of, you know, the changes that we're seeing, um, throughout the city and beyond. So, uh, as you said, I think you know we need to do what we can to help property owners and businesses thrive here. So I would sure. agree with Commissioner Yeah, no, that's Klausimer. great. I appreciate it. Yeah, Com Commissioner Elmore. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Klausimer and, and uh, Commissioner Kleinman. Um, I don't, having the ability to bring it back based upon a conditional use permit so we get to see it again, I think is the safety net that we need in terms of these other items that can or potentially will be coming in front of us, I don't think it's appropriate that we pause making decisions on items because of what ifs or uncertainties, things that we don't know. We don't know how these other items are gonna come about. So I think it's, it's prudent on us to make a decision based upon what's in front of us. And, and I agree with the, my other two colleagues that I would support this. Great, thank you. Is there a motion? That's fine. I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to approve. I don't have the... Um, what's that, PA2020-316? Cool. And do you want to make that motion with any amendments to it as far as types of restaurants that are allowable or any type of... No, I don't, at least personally, I don't think that's necessary based upon what we just discussed, the fact that we would have the ability with these uh, permits to opine on them at that time. Okay. In a second? I'll second. Okay, I'll call for the vote. The motion carries 5-1 with Vice Chair Larry being recused. Great, thank you. 5-1-1. Okay, I'll move on to uh, our next item. This is a study session. This is item number three. This is the initial draft of the general plan housing element. P PA 2017-141. Site location is citywide. Uh, Commissioner Lowry has returned. And again, if you want to comment on this item, please call 949-270-8165. And uh, staff will provide a presentation discussion of the initial draft of the general plan housing update. And the commission will not be taking any action tonight.
but we may be providing comments or direction to staff and the consultants. Commissioner Ketting looks at me about comments. I'm sure he has some. All right, staff, with your presentation, please. Sure, uh, Chairman uh, Jim Campbell, Deputy Director. I'm going to. We're going to be doing a tag team presentation here this evening. I'm doing the introduction. Ben's going to take a bit, and then our consultant David Barquest will be here to uh, make uh, some remarks. Um, you know, as we've been working on this for roughly two years. Uh, tonight, we're seeking your input on the document. We're not asking you to make a recommendation to the City Council, but we're just seeking input and comment. And so all the comments that we get at all of the public meetings, and Ben will summarize those in a moment for you, you know, we've been taking feedback and input, and it's informing how this draft comes about. Um, and it, you'll be learning a little bit about some of the state mandates that we have to uh, comply with, and so it makes it difficult to, to adhere to everyone's comments and to, to reflect everyone's feedback. Um, but, but it does influence how we, we are going about the draft. Um, you know, Ben's going to go over uh, some of the f next steps that are going to come up, but we are going to the City Council later this month, so we're hopeful to get some feedback tonight from you and the public, and that will help us make a better presentation to the Council. Uh, going forward. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ben. I'll give you a little bit of the, um, the background uh, and where we've, where we've come and some of the outreach that we've done over the preceding year. Ben? Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Ben Zadiba, Senior Planner with the Planning Division. Uh, good evening, Chair Wygan, Commissioners. So as Jim said, uh, we've done a lot of community outreach and attempted a lot of community engagement at the same time which are two different things, uh, through this process, which started a long time ago. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, we actually started holding general plan update steering committee meetings in early 2019. In fact, we held 12 of them. I'll note that that committee is now dissolved. Um, and that was largely due to the fact that during that effort, you know, that, that a whole listen and learn effort that was uh, the culmination of the general plan update steering committee um, had to pivot due to the parallel track of the regional housing needs assessment, which was an astronomical number that came out at the time. We then shifted towards housing, and that's why you see the General Plan Update Steering Committee dissolved. And in 2020, the Housing Element Update Advisory Committee was formed, and that committee is currently active. Um, they've held 13 meetings. So again, I just wanted to splay the dates out for you so you can see that we've held a lot of committee meetings. Uh, those are all Brown Act meetings. They're all publicly noticed and publicly attended, accessible to the community, and we do encourage the community to attend those. Beyond that, we've also held workshops. Um, unfortunately, in the recent year, uh, we had to do a lot of this via Zoom. So you'll see on the bottom right, there's a nice screenshot there with Deputy Director Campbell presenting on an area. On the left, you'll see the listen and learn e effort, which was more in person, more nice organic um, approach. We had seven different meetings and workshops that were supposed to be in the seven different council districts. Uh, I put the participant counts for you to show you that we did have a fairly good turnout in most cases. Uh, the List and Learn was a more broad uh, introduction to the general plan and its purpose, goals, policies, with a unique focus on housing, again, due to the arena coming out. We wanted to educate the community on that requirement and what is being required of the city. The Housing Element Update workshops have been specific to housing. We've talked about sites analysis, site identification, which is what you're seeing on the bottom right there. Jim is showing the airport area and describing what density could be there, uh, what the affordability might be like, and letting the community react and provide input. As far as advertising goes, uh, staff feels like we've done about everything that we possibly can short of knocking on doors. Uh, we've distributed flyers, we've put utility bill inserts in all the utility bills for three straight months and beyond, which reaches 14,000 residents each month. Uh, we've done e-blasts, we've done next door posts, uh, committee members, what that's referencing, we have uh, very active committee members on the Housing Element Update Advisory Committee who have emailed personally uh, their resident associations trying to garner some interest in the topic. Uh, we also have council announcements. The city's website frequently has updates. In fact, we have large banners displaying that the drafts are available for public review. Uh, we also have the Newport Together website, which is... Uh, inclusive of the entire process and includes a lot of the interactive activities that were presented at each of the workshops in case someone couldn't make it. We've also gone uh, old school and done printed newspaper as well as online newspaper ads. 
Uh, the graphic that you see there is an example of a utility bill insert. So we've got QR code on the back that takes you to the Newport Together website and gives you a lot of information about upcoming events. Once again, that reaches 14,000 residents each month. As far as the upcoming schedule goes, uh, tonight would have been on here, but we are here. So uh, the next opportunity is April 27th, which is City Council. Uh, we're hoping to submit a progress draft to the State Department of Housing and Community Development by mid-May. They'll have a 60-day review period within which they will review and provide us uh, findings at the end of it for us to address. Um, so you'll see in August, we're then hoping to have the Housing Element Update Advisory Committee review those comments and provide potential changes in a public forum. Again, those are all Brown Act meetings. Uh, they'll review it again, and then we'll be taking it back to you for consideration. Uh, it looks like twice, so we'll have initial review, and then the secondary meeting would be for recommendation to City Council. And then you'll see October 12th, that's kind of the ultimate goal here, to have City Council adopt the housing element and certify the EIR. And then we will be submitting that adopted housing element to HCD for consideration and certification. Uh, that is the upcoming schedule in a nutshell. And I just, again, wanted to give you a uh, overview of the kind of outreach that uh, City has done so far. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave Barquist from Kimley Horn, our consultant. Got a little slide here, so I'll start in just a moment. Uh, there we go. So the uh, draft, uh, good evening. Uh, the draft of the plan is really for your discussion today. Obviously, as Ben had mentioned, there's uh, another uh, series of iterations that will occur um, with the extent of the RENA regional housing needs assessment and the alphabet soup of assembly bills and Senate bills. Housing element updates have become a full contact sport in many respects. So. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, we want to give you a, a quick summary of what that is and in, entertain your questions or your uh, comments on, on the draft. Essentially, the, the draft of the plan, it is an initial draft. Uh, this is an ability for us to have some input with the, the public as well as the advisory committee and the uh, elected and appointed officials in the community prior to being submitted to the state for review. What the state does is they review it for compliance with all of these 67-plus uh, laws that have been related to housing since 2017, among other statutory requirements. Uh, we want to give them something that is representative of your, of your community as well as something that is compliant or um, meets the spirit and intent of the law as it's uh, written today. So you can see in the uh, plan of the process is going through the review with you as a, a, as a uh, a group and then uh, council later in this month. There's a public review period that closes at the end of the month uh, that will consider additional comments from the community. Uh, we've seen those, some of those are in your packet today and available uh, in various means. There will be some additional changes to the, the element uh, regarding the sites and other considerations when we look at statutory requirements. Uh, making sure that we've uh, crossed our T's and dotted our I's and making sure we have the statutory compliance issues, but also ensuring that we reflect the community's concerns and your concerns as part of the document. So real briefly, in the staff report, uh, you had a summary of the uh, document. I'll go briefly of what it's contained in there. Uh, the first portion of the plan is really setting the stage for the policy, its relationship to the general plan and the overall organizational aspects of the document. Uh, the community profile is a demographic econometric analysis of the existing community. It really sets a framework of uh, initial need. You look at things such as population, housing units, among other things. Section three is a very meaty section. Uh, resources and constraints related to non-governmental constraints, governmental constraints. There's analysis of fair housing as is new required by the law. That's quite extensive that goes in here. And there's a summary of the resources available to address housing issues that may be programs, funding, as well as the sites available to accommodate uh, anticipated growth. Uh, section four is really the foundation of, of the document. It's the policy plan. So if you think of the, the footing for this plan, it is of itself the policies that are reflected in uh, section four. Uh, so that's an important part of it because it essentially is the homework assignment to accommodate and, and um, 
um, implement the plans through the next eight-year uh, planning cycle through uh, 2029. Uh, there are a, a few appendices in the plan that support the analysis, the first being the review of past performance, looking at the current adopted fifth cycle, uh, learning lessons from that hindsight's 2020, for example, making sure that we understand um, uh, the policies we have, how they worked. In many cases, the policies and programs will continue uh, within this cycle and be supplemented by additional considerations. Uh, Appendix B is the adequate sites analysis that gets in the details about the sites, which we'll get into detail here in a little bit. And then finally, uh, summary of the engagement. So uh, for all of those folks in the community who've participated, they can actually put their finger on their participation in that appendix. It is demonstration as the law requires to make diligent efforts to collaborate with the community and that's an expression of that in the plan itself. But what an important part of this is we look at two pieces to the pie here. First is your existing need of your existing community. The second is the need that you have projected into the future. And that's what the adequate sites analysis does. It's a fairly extensive based on a whole host of new legislative requirements uh, along this round. It uh, is very uh, in-depth uh, is uh, to say the least, and so it's important to identify the capacity of that. There is very specific provisions in the law that requires to look at, like identifying sites by APN, sites by the assumed affordability levels. These are all, all new components uh, that let the law requires us to do. And really what it is is looking at it, what is the feasible opportunity for sites that could accommodate residential in the future? That's the whole process to go through here. And it's based on the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, uh, we call RENA, uh, and it's based on a ability to forecast growth needs for the planning period. In this case, the growth needs that you see on the bottom right of the table is about 4,800 units over the eight-year planning period. So what is the role of the city is to show you have the capacity to accommodate that number of units by those income categories within your policy program. It does not mean the city needs to build those. Uh, the city is not in that business, but providing the capacity for the private market to do it itself. The things that the city can um, provide for or assistance are exactly the things that are reflected in your policy program to help to uh, uh, bring those uh, uh, from ideas to doorknobs, if you will. Again, the issue is it's the capacity to accommodate, so your policy should show the ability to accommodate that growth in the future. So now we're gonna do a little math game, and I'm not gonna complicate this too much, but there are things that are happening today. Drive around, you see development projects. Uh, we have accessory dwelling unit law that requires uh, or allows for a substantial change in the ability to accommodate a residential through addressory dwelling units, and then you have sites within your fifth cycle that are still available to plan. So we can look at those and net those out uh, for that remaining RENA need. So what you see in the bottom line there, that remaining need, is really what we're planning for in the housing element. So you saw the 4,800 units. When we reflect existing um, uh, projects that are in the pipeline or under construction or consideration, uh, we can get a net number, and that's what the bottom uh, number represents. You'll note above moderate is blank, and that's because within the existing pipeline projects, you've already met your need for, for the above moderate. So the focus there is on the left side of that, or the lower income spectrum of the, um, of the arena allocation. So how do we go through the site selection process? Your advisory committee, as Ben had mentioned, a number of, I think, 13 or so meetings uh, that have occurred. All of those have been talking about the sites, a number of uh, opportunities for the public to provide their input uh, on the sites. Uh, the idea is focusing on, as we started in 2019, is having the discussion where are those focus areas of growth going to occur. And this was community-led in, in many respects and then starting to focus in on the opportunities each one of those focus areas. That was the task of the advisory committee, uh, was to figure out the feasibility or potential feasibility of these sites. So if you think of a large balloon that's blown up, uh, we're looking in that spectrum to say within this area, what are some opportunities? 
looked at it on a site-by-site -site basis uh, to look at that. And so only the portion of land um, needed to identify um, that we've identified in the plan needs to accommodate arena. So we've blown up the envelope of opportunity, but when we implement that through a policy, it's only gonna be a portion of that we need. So it provides us with a uh, opportunity uh, universe of sites that we can accommodate. When we use the term development potential, some folks think of it as build out. We wanna to express to you that it's not build out of that, but rather the ability for you to show capacity to accommodate growth. As required by the law, we have to show your capacity to accommodate that growth need through the future. This is a demonstration of that. The numbers that you see in, pan, in the plan aren't necessarily representations of build out. Rather, they are estimates of the capacity of your existing policy and or future policy to accommodate growth. And it is the framework that you'll use uh, to establish policies and program that some of your uh, council or some of your committee members, uh, commi commission members had mentioned the overlay among other things or the strategies to accommodate that. And so those are articulated in the policy program. Five step process to go through calculating the development potentials. Uh, all of the sites that are identified in the focus areas that you see in the plan. Uh, we make an estimate of the percentage of all those sites in each focus areas that would develop. So those sites that are feasible or potentially feasible, uh, the analysis is done with that. And then we have to distribute the assumptions of affordability of those sites. And they are just assumptions at this point, and we'll give you the rationale for that here in a moment. And then we determine a target density for those areas of focus. And then finally from that, it allows us to calculate the total development potential for those areas. And again, demonstrate to the state that we could accommodate that future growth within the uh, planning period. We did this initial draft uh, as part of, and it's reflected in the housing element. Uh, we did identify a host of sites, uh, quite a bit of analysis and discussion. Uh, there were some comments as part of the process through the public uh, in the workshops and the advisory committee uh, to take another look at those sites and reevaluate the methodology and those considerations as part of the plan. And some of those rationale or reasonings were uh, provide a more equitable distribution of units citywide, so we're not focusing, for example, uh, the, a majority of the lower income units in one specific area, but it's distributed more of an equitable manner across those focus areas. And then also the, the affordability levels that we see and distribute it, and so there's more of a uh, enhanced uh, equitable uh, layout of those opportunities. And then some of the de development assumptions in terms of densities were reevaluated based on the particular characteristics of, the, uh, of each of these focus areas that we'll go in here in a moment. And the advisory committee is generally supportive of that process and uh, that's reflected in their, uh, the minutes of their meetings. So let's get into those sites that we had talked about. You see here, these are the focus areas, if you will. Uh, as developed uh, back through 2019. Each one of those I'm gonna go through in specific as we're gonna go around the dial here for the most part uh, for these opportunities and you'll be able to see uh, a map and a summary table of what that is. We won't get into full details, uh, but this will give you a summarization of that. Uh, the airport area that was part of the fourth and fifth cycle, so it has been always a focus area to accommodate future residential. Uh, there's plan for higher density residential, which in turn can provide higher opportunities to accommodate a more affordable housing products. Uh, the assumed density in the area is about 50 units per acre, so it's a much more intensive type of development in this area as compared to some of the, uh, some of the others. Uh, you can see the graphic here on the screen. Uh, this will be representative as we go through all the different focus areas. Uh, but the areas that you see in blue were deemed potentially feasible or feasible opportunities for development in, in the future. You'll note you'll see some pink areas there or shaded. Those are actually in the pipeline project. So it'll give you a sense uh, if you look at the uh, projects that are in the pipeline in, in comparison to the opportunity areas, you can see there's some level of uh, transitional opportunities there. 
162 acres within the area, but we only assume 25% of that blue area needs to redevelop to accommodate that growth. So our universe is 162, and our potential for change is, is, needs to be only about 25% to show we can accommodate that growth. Uh, for West Newport Mesa, uh, identified as a, a major reinvestment opportunity uh, with the existing development with HOG uh, and other uh, medical related uses, the jobs housing issue came into uh, conversation uh, with the community, uh, that adjacency with those uh, job opportunities and providing for uh, our working community here in the uh, local area is an important factor in considering that. Um, it assumes only about 30% of the area would transition over time, and you can see the densities in there are assumed to be about 45 dwelling units per acre is our assumption. Uh, here is uh, the kind of summary of those sites you see here on the right, uh, the uh, area in blue. The, the area that's banning ranch here on the left should not be shaded in this case, so we apologize for that. Uh, Dover West Cliff, sound familiar? <laughs> this is an opportunity area uh, to support densities that are compatible with those surrounding uses. has a different character and a feel in that area, so you can see the density standards are, are um, less than the areas that we've just gone over. Uh, there's limited uh, opportunity in the area. We've identified about 14 acres of opportunity of about 40% of that area is assumed to transition over the planning period. Uh, the real Newport quick, Center. Real quick on that last yeah. slide, there were some green shades there, but it, there's no, is that the fifth cycle site, fifth housing cycle site? Is that what that green is? Yes, and, and, there's, um, and there's a mixed use area there along the um, uh, Mariner's Mile, for example. So the area that we're speaking to is on the, just at Dover Westcliff. So, um, and there's some sites up, up to the top of the screen, but those ones there are just uh, um, uh, just some of the mapping issues that we came with. So I, w I would discount any of those coloring. When you, when you discuss Dover Westcliff, you're mostly referring to the, the light blue, the teal color more so than, yeah, the, you're, this, this, than this the Mariner's area. Mile. That, that's more a, a different area. Are we considering Mariner's Mile, Dover Westcliff? That area, oops, make sure this is Sorry on. to interrupt your presentation. I, oh, I no, hate no. when people do it, and I, <laughs> my apologies. It's At working. your pleasure. Uh, yeah, the Mariner's Mile area, we're not proposing any changes there, and that there, those are existing housing opportunities out of the fifth element, uh, the fifth cycle, which is the prior housing element. And so that's just representative to show where those opportunities are. They're accounted for in the tables as the, the fifth cycle sites. So that's not an area of change that we're discussing here today. So. The area where we're looking at is just really that Dover Westcliff area that we discussed earlier, uh, the teal sites there along Dover. And uh, we're looking at changing it to a slightly increase in the density to 30 dwelling units per acre as opposed to 26.7. So it's a modest change for that area. And that totally makes sense why you call it Dover Westcliff because that's the area that it is. So my apologies for interrupting. Real quick on that, you said the fifth. Explain that to, to the public and us. The fifth cycle. Uh, yes, so each of the, we, we call it the planning cycle. So if you think about areas of, uh, this is from the state, and we say six cycle, it's a planning period from 2021 uh, to 2029. When you say fifth cycle, it is 2014 to 2021, and then and so on. It's, it's basically now the statutorily, as we move forward, leapfrog through time, it will be on eight-year cycles. And so you seven, eight, nine, ten, if that survives that long. Okay, let's see here. Uh, so again, a, a little lesser opportunity in this area for, for change in consideration of existing development, existing uh, uses and other things were consideration of the development assumptions for the area. Uh, New Newport Center has some um, uh, additional considerations. Uh, you've noticed in the uh, recent years some um, residential development that has occurred in the area. There's an expectation that that would occur, continue to occur over time uh, in selected areas adjacent to obviously housing, employment, retail, uh, other opportunities uh, with a proposed density of approximately 45 dwelling units an acre. 
There's another consideration on this site that we wanted to, uh, that Jim will talk about is uh, the uh, site plane ordinance. But as we look at the areas in blue that you see here, a uh, number of those opportunity sites uh, that will uh, indicate, but the area to the south of that is an area where the 162 acres, a, a component of that is dictated by some existing long-term policies that relate to a site plane ordinance. And I believe we have a map that we're gonna show you here, but as Jim's getting up to the, uh, the podium, uh, 162 opportunity areas, but about 25% assumption of the redevelopment of that area. So the inventory you see in blue, uh, the need is to uh, redevelop at least 25% of that area to show accommodation of your arena need. Oh, was it in there? I got a blank. There we go. Uh, Mr. Chair, I wanted to just go ahead and uh, explain the site plane or site plane view ordinance, if you will. Um, you've received some correspondence from folks who uh, live across the way uh, um, that you can see that on the, the right side of the diagram there. Uh, the site plane review, the site plane ordinance, so you're, you're getting a lot of comments to, to protect and preserve and make sure we don't have housing that would penetrate that and then potentially block the views. And that's the reason I wanted to just alert you to this. Um, it was an ordinance that was created back in 1972. It was carried forward in three planned communities that are there today. Um, it's basically a 32 foot height building height and um, it also you could be higher than that as long as you're below this view plane which preserves the, the view for that neighborhood. So I just want to just highlight that for you today. You're going to hear comments about that. I think the densities that we are talking about have the potential to go through that site plane. Um, um, but it, then again, there may be opportunities to lower those pads and keep those lower and build a little more, uh, uh, not build so tall, but a little spread out a little bit. So. I think in looking at what that future design is, what a future uh, housing overlay might look like, we'll, we'll, we'll hold that off until we actually get to that point at a later point. So I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have on this. So just as far as, as that goes, that would then be uh, a council direction as far as building and exceeding uh, those uh, numbers that are shown there as far as if there was a residential property that was taller than these numbers listed. How, how does that process work moving forward? Uh, how, do, how do we protect what you know is, is there moving forward? Sure, sure, Chair Wagon. I think there are there's multiple uh, places where you could look at that question. You could look at that now and then not include all these areas that are in uh, and under that site plan. I think we have another map on the next one here. Give me one more slide here, um, if you would. This is actually an overlay of the site plane with the housing opportunity sites that you see in the document tonight. So I guess there's, there's multiple points where we could address that issue, and that is tonight by not including those, we hope to leave them in at this point because we feel there's opportunities to, to not go above the site plane with a future project. The housing overlay that would follow, um, we could also identify development standards that would keep those buildings lower. You know, even at the high densities that we're looking at here, you could end up doing a smaller and lower building that would comply with the site plane. So there's a lot of variables involved. And so, you know, obviously we could look at it today with the housing element. We can look at it, uh, it once it's uh, adopted. We could look at it again, specifically with the standards that would go with that residential overlay to protect and preserve the view. So we've got these multiple opportunities. We would like to proceed forward with what we're recommending today and deal with the height of the buildings within the overlay, which would come after the housing element. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Lowry. That was a private easement, right? That was the, um, that the Irvine company put on that. I forget how that actually worked. It, it, it's, it's not a private easement. Okay. It was an ordinance adopted by the ordinance. city as a height limit. And then, it, then the city adopted it three additional times with the, with the corporate plaza plan community, the Newport Village plan community, which governs this site, and the shopping center next door, and the uh, corporate plaza west, which is across Newport Center Drive. So it's in, we've adopted it three times, if you will. Okay. So it's a city policy applicable to development that's there. Okay, because I was confused. So it's, just, it's an ordinance. There's nothing on title, you say, that's, that's in those buildings that would have put in by the previous owner that you cannot exceed that height limit. Uh, I'm not aware of anything on title related to that. Okay, thanks. But it's the only place in Newport where residents are protected of their views compared to only just public property or like parks and 
public view plain? Well, I would say it's a unique ordinance in town. There's none other. There's nothing like it. But everyone has the protections of the, the standards of the zoning code that would protect views. So when we have we have building heights standards for every property, and that does afford some protection of, of private and public views. Thank you. And uh, the last few here, uh, the, the next one is the Coyote Canyon area. Uh, as you're all familiar, it's a closed landfill. Uh, there are limitations on what you can do, what you can build, and uh, you can build residential, for example, but there are some feasible considerations in terms of the cost to build. Uh, those are all considerations that were debated and, and discussed. <clears throat> you have in the area here, which is the landfill you see on the screen, is the uh, open area of land that you see obviously is the entirety of the landfill but there is a portion within that and that is uh, 22 acres which is indicated in the blue that provides some level of protection if you will um, it's not limited by some of the restrictions on the landfill so it's a component of that total area uh, the city believes and the advisory committee believes that that's 100% uh, of that site could be used to accommodate residential. There was uh, conversations about the site in terms of the distribution of affordability, uh, and those are still up for conversation as far as what the expectations of affordability is on the site. It is a, a zone within the city, and it is so it wouldn't have to do any uh, rezoning, I believe. Uh, it would have to do some. Yes, it would. Sorry, uh, strike that. Uh, but there is, um, it's county owned property. Uh, there's already been some conversations with uh, a developer interest and the county as far as the, the use of that land and that property. And when you compare all the sites that you've listed so far, the five or six of them, that, that's the only one that has just one uh, landowner, correct? Or, uh, one, one property. One property. That's, yes. It's not multiple And it's tenants. a portion of that property. The one entity has the say of what to do yes. there. Yes, one site control of one, one party. And then uh, Banning Ranch, which we're all intimately familiar with in the, in the community, uh, that was used in a prior period to accommodate that growth. Uh, as you know, it was previously denied uh, by the Coastal Commission. Uh, it is reflected in the uh, existing, um, you know, discussions we had. Uh, looking at that site as an opportunity area for growth in the future with a proposed average density based on the uh, prior proposal, and I believe it's reflected in some of the assumptions of the general plan as well, of the 1,300-some-odd 13 odd units. So that is a, an average density. Uh, different development products could occur in there. So... You can see the 46 acres, assuming that area in blue there, uh, could redevelop uh, for opportunity. The 1375 is consistent with uh, prior discussions of the opportunity for the area there. Obviously, there's some other issues that will come up with the considerations of this as we go through the process. What we wanted to show here, this is a summarization of the slides that you've seen. Uh, you can see the arena allocation, which is the top. Uh, I'll work my way down the, the rows here. Uh, the arena allocation on the top uh, is the, the, where we start. We start looking at uh, accessory dwelling units. Uh, that's based on methodologies and consideration of a more, we say, aggressive approach to accommodating that, which the city has the right to do. Pipeline projects, among other things. Uh, the rezone strategies of the sites that you've identified. And it has a total development potential you see in the teal uh, color there, meaning that there's an opportunity in these areas to accommodate that much growth if, if um, uh, to demonstrate your ability to accommodate your arena need. What I want you to note here is you see the bottom of that, there is a percentage over need. And really what that is is what we'd consider a buffer. And it's important consideration as we talk through the new requirements of state law. And one of those is no net loss. And so essentially what that is is that buffer is a protectionary measure, if you will, from no net loss. And so what the state law requires us to consider that any point in time in the planning period, 
we must demonstrate sites available to accommodate the current unaccommodated need, if that makes sense. So if we have sites that don't either redevelop for residential or develop at a lesser density than we assumed or affordability levels, we need to demonstrate other opportunity sites to accommodate that. If we can't do that, we have to do what we'll call ad hoc rezoning of sites to accommodate that. And you have statutorily 180 days to do each subsequent rezoning action to show your accommodation or address that no net loss issue. So the, the number that you see there in the green, the percentages, is uh, used as essentially a protection from that no net loss. Uh, if that wasn't to be included in the plan, and it doesn't have to be, uh, it is a uh, recommendation by HCD and standard practice among many jurisdictions to protect you from having to do those ad hoc uh, zoning revisions over the course of the planning period. So think about it in terms of comprehensively planning today so you don't have to do ad hoc planning on a on a case by case basis in the future. So the next step, uh, considering your comments and your conversation here, uh, there will be a city council study session, I believe, uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, we'll be submitting or, or accepting comments to the public uh, up and through April 30th, and we've gotten a number of those comments. Uh, Newport together uh, has the, the the place for folks to download that and provide comments. Again, as uh, to rearticulate to you, there will be some changes to the element, uh, making sure that we comply with all the statutory requirements, as well as just checking, uh, you know, everything from spelling errors to uh, modifying some of the analysis to comply with what the law requires us to do. And then once we get there, there'll be a draft that will go up to the state for their review and consideration. And so they will come back to the city and say, here's what you need to do to change the document to comply with the state law or say you have substantially with uh, uh, comply with statute and you will be uh, once that you take action in the future you'll have a certified housing element so uh, with that uh, I will turn it over to Jim to uh, thank you Dave for that presentation um, you know it what we're looking for tonight is just a discussion of, of what you see in the draft. We want to get your feedback on the draft. Are the densities appropriate? Are the locations appropriate? Are the affordability assumptions appropriate? ADUs, we can talk about any of the policies that are in there and we can answer any questions that you might have. Obviously, we want to take public input tonight. Um, and in addition to the next steps that Dave had indicated there and kind of piggybacking on the slide that um, um, Ben had put up earlier, um, you know, we're submitting a draft to the state for the 60-day review period. So we're going to get comments from the state. They're going to have a list of things that we need to change. So when we get that, we're going to bring that back to the Housing Element Committee in, in August, and then we're going to make incorporation and changes to the document. So in essence, we're going to do this all over again in the fall. The one thing that we're going to have in the fall that we don't have today is we're going to have an environmental impact report for everyone to evaluate. So what are the, what are the impacts of this? You know, what, what are the impacts of traffic? We're going to have a traffic study prepared. So we're going to know what the vehicle miles traveled are and what the changes are to the intersection level of service. And we're going to look at all of the other infrastructure needs. So all of that's going to be evaluated in an EIR. And then that'll be available for your consideration in the fall. So uh, again, tonight, you're, again, we're going to have another bite at the apple here. and We're going to have more information as we go forward with this process. So. Again, that's one of the reasons why we're not asking for you to make a recommendation to the City Council this evening. Again, we're looking just for feedback and input and then public comments here, and that will help inform changes to the draft that we may put forward, and again, for, for the state to consider. Um, so it, none of this is set in stone is what I'm really getting to. So with that, um, you know, if you've got any comments, we're here to answer any questions, Dave, myself, and Ben, and Simone, um, and obviously we want to take public comment. Great, thank you. I appreciate, Dave, the hard work, and Jim, and Ben, and Simone, and then also Chair Tucker and his committee. Uh, they spent a lot of time, as have you, um, but uh, as uh, non-paid um, uh, volunteers for the city, the, the, the committee put in a lot of hard work. So I appreciate uh, uh, former Commissioner uh, Tucker and now um, many, many roles uh, he has provided our city. So I thank them for their hard work and service. So I'll open up to commission for your comments. Do you want to start with you, Commissioner Rosine, or just I'll just wait for hands to, to go up or? I'll keep it brief. 
I did have just a couple of real brief comments. And um, one was as it relates to the ADUs. And, you know, ADUs, the way that I envision them and trying to figure out how you would monitor the income level on some of these units, uh, would that be through deed restriction for every version or? The answer is no. Our, our intent is not to monitor them in that way. So what, what we do is we, we have a questionnaire for the owner to fill out. How are they going to use this? And they're going to check marks and boxes and then self-certify how they're going to use it. And if it does fit the criteria to be a low or very low or a moderate income, then we'll take credit for it as such. Um, if it does not, then we won't. So it, it, but there won't be a monitoring effort where we're going to be knocking on the door to see what's happening. No deed restrictions. Okay. I appreciate that. So um, this one's specific. Um, one of the poly policy actions, it's 1K. I'm pretty sure that that's Section 4. There's a proposed inclusionary housing requirement associated with that uh, policy. And it talks about a 15% uh, for new residential. My question associated with that would be if that was put in place, it, I didn't see a threshold for a unit count on uh, the size of the development. I was wondering if you could. Um, yes, that was actually purposeful. Um, the, the thought here that this policy does two things. It sets up and, and obligates the city to come in with um, an affordable, an inclusionary housing ordinance. And that's 24 months. But in addition to that is to come in and do an interim policy. So we have something immediately. Because what will happen is, is that if we have, uh, we have a result 24 months out, people are going to want to get their housing projects approved without affordable housing inclusion. And that's not going to help us meet our goals here. So the thought is to come up with something immediate. Now, we did put 15% in there for, for discussion purposes. That came out of our prior housing element, not the current housing element, but the housing element that was done in the fourth cycle. Um, and that was the city's policy. Now. In there, there was an ordinance that, uh, not in the policy itself, but um, we had some language in there and in our uh, inclusionary housing ordinance that did pro provide relief for smaller projects. Maybe they would pay an in-lieu fee. And so those details would come about with this interim policy and with the, with the permanent policy. So we didn't want to uh, lock ourselves into one, any one prescriptive way to do it right now. And so it's a general policy. And so it was done purposefully. We would have the opportunity to tailor that in the, in, in, in the adoption of the resolution, adoption of the ordinances that would come in afterward. Was, was that a part of the fifth cycle also? Did I hear you say that? Um, no, the fifth cycle, we only had arena five. And so the inclusionary housing uh, ordinance was uh, abolished and the policy was eliminated with the current housing element. And that was what, eight years ago. All right, thank you, Jim. Commissioner Kleiman. Thank you. Uh, well, I first want to mirror what Chair Wigan said um, about the tremendous work that has been done here. Uh, it's obvious there was just a lot of time and effort put into this, and it's been an interesting year in terms of what the state has thrown at, um, at the city and uh, how staff has handled it, so thank you. Um, I think my first question is um, you kind of started to touch on um, the potential for development standards to help uh, protect and restrict at some point after this initial document. Um, so my, my main question is really, what does that look like? How do we tackle that? And then secondarily, uh, what is Planning Commission's role in that and, and really this, um, this whole housing element? Sure, those are all very good questions. So, so when you look at the policy actions for these different areas, it basically establishes that we're going to go in and take some zoning actions, an overlay or some other, in one case it would be a rezone. In that process, we can, we can put in uh, whatever development standards we need. We can put in processes and development standards, and so that will dictate and guide what happens with that project. We, we would definitely want to put in standards that are appropriate for the densities that are there, because we don't want to have immediately have to do variances for every project. Uh, but we can tailor that to the specific geographies to meet specific uh, goals. If we want to protect and preserve views in certain ways, we can have a one height limit. In other areas, maybe the airport area where the views are less, less important, um, then they might have a different height limit. And so we can put all those development standards in those overlays and in those zoning actions. 
Now, the Planning Commission will have a role in that, and they'll be reviewing those as an ordinance. So you'll see the entire text of that uh, overlay, so and you'll be able to provide comments on that, feedback, direct some changes to that, and make a recommendation to the City Council for adoption. So you'll play a prominent role in that effort. Okay, so that's sort of the next phase of this, if you will. Yes, it is the next phase after the policy. So once the housing element is adopted, then it basically sets up a scenario where we have to create that zoning overlay or that zoning strategy within three years. And so, you know, yes, that's where the detail of how that, the mechanics of how that overlay would work, you know, the setbacks, the height limit, the parking, all those site development standards would go into that overlay and you would see that. So uh, we're, we're hopeful to keep it um, um, general today and to get more specific over time. I guess one, one thing I might suggest is that if we get too specific in this document, we, you know, we could get locked into that with HCD review and we don't want to get too specific because we don't have the answers right now. If that is helpful. It is, um, which leads to my next question. Uh, I, I assume there's some um, consortium of, of uh, other planners who are looking at, you know, facing these, these same um, issues, particularly in the coastal areas. And just kind of curious how everyone else is facing, you know, how they're dealing with it and, um, and more specifically, the Coastal Commission issues. Like, you know, we've talked about banning ranch a number of times in the presentation. Um, you know, what if we just said, okay, yeah, we're putting forth banning ranch again. We know that's not going to be approved. So, um, you know, what, um, what are we really tasked with? I mean, if we know that there are certain areas that we're willing to, or we know that there are developers willing to build in, but we also know that the other, um, the other state agencies are going to stand in the way of that happening. Um, what's our responsibility in that? Well, our responsibility is to create a, a plan that provides the opportunities to meet the arena, and we do feel that Banning Ranch is an important component in that because you know a lot of that area is vacant. It is constrained environmentally, as you know, and we are beholden to the Coastal Commission, if you will. We don't control our destiny, ultimately, but we do feel that we can provide the zoning for this. In fact, we do have an old PC text right now that does allow residential development there, but obviously it's, it's quite out of date. Um, but we do feel it's an important uh, component. Um, you know, we have been working with other, um, we, we have been collaborating, you know, with other, other communities, and, and it's a challenge. All the cities are struggling with trying to find enough sites, and we're all doing it at the same time. And we're all learning different things from talking to the state and talking to our others. And so, you know, we're trying to uh, understand the best practices going forward. And so we feel we have that here with us. Um, but, you know, Banning Ranch is a difficult one. The coastal zone is, is challenging. Um, you know, one of the reasons we didn't look at the coastal zone so heavily beyond the, 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 the sites that are in the plan, you know, we're looking at the ADUs as a way to provide additional housing opportunities in the coastal zone. Um, you know, the coastal area obviously has more resources, public access, and at every summertime, you, we all know what happens. It becomes a, a, a heavily congested area, and so we felt that would not be a good place to put additional density. And, and that, that was reflected in all the comments that we got from the community. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your question. Um, I'm happy to fill in the blanks if I didn't get to catch it all. Yeah, I just have two more quick questions. Um, the first one being whether, first of all, how we came up with these density calculations. Um, I guess it's really three questions. <laughs> um, secondarily, whether, whether staff really um, looked closely at the likelihood or the, or, you know, how buildable each of these areas actually is when you take into consideration particularly the, um, the affordable housing component and the, and the density, the type of product and, you know, whether we're, I mean, we're kind of making these assumptions and, and using calculations, but uh, have we really taken the time to to look closely at each of these areas to say, okay, you know, we're we're putting these overlays here, and we're anticipating that uh, that a developer would come in and that a property owner, you know, would would be amenable to these things. But uh, but how buildable, you know, how practical are these assumptions? Sure. Um, 
well, let's take the airport area. Uh, we, we worked with the Housing Element Update Advisory Committee and we went parcel by parcel. We, we looked at every single parcel in the airport area and the committee kind of whittled this down into what they felt was, was feasible. You know, if it's a, you know, if it's a 20 story office building, the thought was, well, maybe that's not gonna redevelop. So it was excluded. So we really started looking at um, um, you know, where you've got a two story office building that's on a surface parking lot. You've got a very low improvement value to the land value. So you've got, not a lot of buildings, but a lot of land. And so that was, that, that's an opportunity, especially given the age of these buildings. We looked at the age of the buildings and, and, and those factors tell us, well, okay, this might be a possibility. Um, you know, we actually looked in areas in the airport area, and this is something that you should be aware of, that, that the, some of the areas in the airport area are actually within the 65 dB CNEL noise contour. So it's a higher noise area because we were looking for more sites because we didn't feel we had enough. Um, so that's, part of the airport area that's larger. So we went lot by lot. Now the density assumption for the airport area is, is consistent with the existing general plan today, which is 50 dwelling units per acre. In fact, it's a range 30 to 50 dwelling units per acre. And, and when you see these densities in the document, you should all be aware that it does not include density bonus. And so by state law, a, a, a developer can come in and seek additional density above and beyond that maximum uh, to make that affordable housing. So that's sort of the offset that, that happens. Um, um, you know, the Dover Westcliff area, we looked at that area very specifically and we looked, well, do we think the church is going to develop tomorrow? Probably not. Do we think the large office building? Probably not. But what's left? It's about 40% and that's reflected in the plan. Uh, the density for uh, Dover Westcliff, you know, in consultation with the community and, you know, with our knowledge of the community, we didn't go for 50 dwelling units per acre because we didn't feel a 60 foot building out there is really a great idea. So, you know, it is, is right now it's 26 dwelling units per acre that you could do today, but that's not enough density with a mixed use project to make anything happen there. Nothing's happened since 2006. So we thought, well, okay, let's ratchet the density up a little bit and see if something could happen. So that's got us to 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, the committee had a robust discussion about possibly increasing that at the last meeting, and it, ultimately there wasn't a consensus to do so. So long story short, you know, we looked at each area in this way and we feel those assumptions that are in the document are pretty good. You know, they are a lot of assumptions and they're estimates. Um, um, you know, is it gonna be the reality? You know, I, I, we, we won't know. We didn't dive into the financial feasibility of any particular site. We really don't have the resources to do that. We don't know the financial um, constraints that are on any one given property. So we, we really can't do that level of detail. That's for the property owner and the developer to do. And so we're just providing the opportunity and zoning, and then if, it, if, if the conditions are, are correct and it turns out to be financially viable and feasible, because as we all know, a developer's not gonna build this project with house, affordable housing or not if it's not financially viable, if they're not making money doing it, it just won't happen. So um, you know, the, that, consul, that consideration about financial feasibility is, is left for, for the, the private sector to figure out. Thank you. Hopefully that answers the question. It does, thank you. And just one last question for the moment. Anyway, um, you mentioned the next step being the environmental review and uh, you know, a, a massive, I'm sure, EIR. So my question is, what happens if that gets challenged? Then what? You know, if this whole thing gets tied up and we've got deadlines to meet and um, you know, penalties potentially. Well, that, that, that's entirely possible. You know, the EIR could be challenged. Um, you know, we're, we're still shooting for a target to adopt it in October. Um, 120 days after that, or actually the 121st day, there's a substantial penalty in state law that we need to avoid. So we have a little bit of time at the end of this process. Um, but you know, the certification of the EIR and adoption of the element would occur. We would submit it to the state, so we would be compliant with the state statute to do that. A challenge could come in at that point in time and, and it potentially could unravel the entire picture. Yes, if, if the EIR was deemed inadequate, um, you know, the remedy would be to, 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 to unravel the approval. Uh, the hope is, is that that will not occur. You know, we're gonna, we've hired Kimley Horn to prepare an EIR. They're doing the traffic analysis as well. Um, they are a reputable, incredible firm. We hope that, that the EIR will be, will be complete and adequate. Thank you, Commissioner Climate. Commissioner Ketting. Thank you. Um, I, I suspect, first of all, this was a fascinating draft of this document. It was just so much work went into it. I have to applaud the staff and the consultant and Larry Tucker's committee. Um, the detail, it was 
Very interesting, I'm telling you. Um, you don't want us to look tonight at specific areas and say, why would you eliminate that lot or that lot? Or why don't you think about this? That will come, right? Um, you, you most certainly can make those comments. If you, uh, I might not have the, uh, the knowledge and remembrance of, of why the committee looked at each one, but right. you know, I was in the subcommittee meetings with Larry Tucker and his committee, and, and we looked at all the sites, and then the entire committee looked at it. Um, so I mean, if you wanted to discuss a particular site, we might do that offline, but, um, but if I'll, you have a comment about a particular site, please. I'll save these until we get into it further, because I don't want to just drag this on, like why that, not that. First of all, is this format required by the state? The way you set it up, is every city's given a, a template and say, here, fill this out? I'm going to have Dave answer that one. <laughs> Don't go away. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> in, in some respects, yes. There's the statutory requirements. You think of the checklist, if you will, of, of required elements that we have to put in there, uh -huh. which in many respects dictates the organization of it. Uh, there's one thing that's new. Uh, is through AB 1397 and all the site analysis, we're required to provide tables that have a little more detail that have in the past. So you see in the appendix, for example, uh, it's a little thicker read and some of the sections, section three, for example, articulate that. So a lot of it is dictated by what the new statutory provisions are uh, that forces us to do that. But if you looked at most housing elements, follow pretty much follow that frame right. that you have. Going into it a little bit deeper, I think something that's got to be impressed upon the community, it's not 48, 185, whatever the number is, it's 20, what did I write down? 2,632 additional units overlaid, potentially, because you've got credits in there. This is the first time I heard about the credits is when I read this. I think that is important. And the, things, the credits are from what, what's in the pipeline, what's been through the mill, and they may not have started them yet. Am I mistaking? Every table referred to that early in the document. Um, y yes, the, now it, it, it. 48, 45 less 28, 15 that you have credit for leaves 2632 units, some sort, mixture. I'm looking for those numbers here. Uh, page, oh. Rena, page three, eight dash eight zero. Yes, there we go. So so you're, you're right, we do have projects in the pipeline, projects that we built, all the, the 78 low income units, that's the uh, um, the Newport Crossings project. So Without already, naming them all. Yeah, I mean, that's one of them and well, so. The, yeah, right. the report spoke of them. I thought that was good information because, you know, people say 4,800, where are you going to put them? Well, that's nice to know that almost half of those are already earmarked someday down the road. Just a comment. Um, I think that's good. Um, these are housing opportunities. It's an overlay. Because when you look at some of these aerial photos, which are great with the colors and stuff, it's massive. Mm -hmm. And somebody's going to read this and say, what in the heck? And then you put probability in there, 30 percent, 25, 40, that could come off. That's mm -hmm. uh, they're just overlays. It's not people have come to me and say, well, they got to rezone my industrial, my, my business. I said, no, it's just a, a, a layer of planning documents, nothing more. You can think of it like a, an overlay. It's an added opportunity. The, the intent of that yeah. would be is to not affect what you're doing today. And you it, can continue to do what you're doing today under the existing zoning. It, but just imagine an overlay with an added opportunity that you could go to housing if you chose to under these certain rules. Right. And, and that it, would be development standards and affordability and, and what have you. Sure, because it's referred to in here as housing opportunity overlay districts, which is a lot different than the city's going to go in there and blanket rezone your property. No, you can't have another mechanic shop. Not the case. This is way up there in the cloud. Okay. Um, how realistic is this? The percentages. I mean, do you have any? Have you met with the major landowners and said, "Hey, we're we're, we're going to put you in here"? Have you gotten a lot of feedback by somebody saying, "What'd you do that for?" Yeah. 
We, we've received, um, uh, we, we sent out uh, two letters and we're actually in the process of sending out a, a third letter to all of these property owners. We have received letters of interest uh, from some of them. I wish we had more and we're hopeful to get a few more. We've met with a few property owners over the years and more recently related to this. Um, and so, you know, that's another uh, gauge of interest, if you will. Um, you know, like the Dover Westcliff area, and that's just based upon our knowledge of what's out there on the ground. And we do have one property owner, actually, we have two property owners in that area who are interested that we that have submitted letters that we've met. So, um, you know, while the airport area is quite a large area, um, uh, we, we do have some interested property owners out there. We've got property owners who are, are, are planning projects as we speak that I anticipate seeing in the next couple of weeks. And so, it's kind of a body of all that information. But you know, we do believe that those redevelopment percentages are necessary to meet the arena. Do we think 25% is actually going to occur in the airport area? You know, it, it's hard to say. I don't have a crystal ball, but it, but it is a reasonable assumption for this planning document. And with limited knowledge of Coyote Canyon, I mean, we've seen areas that can be dug up and they take the all the, the the you know the, the trashy dirt out of there and. and bring in fill and you know it costs money it takes time and so but that is a massive area of land that's just going to sit there well it, right now this county of orange has uh, an option agreement with tate and associates to develop a golf course there um, so we expect that to continue um, you know digging up a landfill and relocating it that's a significant cost and 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 so we felt that it was not feasible to do that you know, just got a lot of environmental constraints the 22 acres that we're, we're, we've identified, uh, we identified that with Tate. This is an area that's not impacted by the landfill. It's directly below it. Access is challenging. If you know that area very well, it's getting to that piece of dirt is going to be hard. But that area uh, is not affected by the landfill. They're interested. The county's interested. We feel that, and, that there's a viable opportunity there. Hence why we added, put 100% on the 22 acres as opposed to some subset of that. And we did make an assumption for affordable housing there um, of, of 35, um, what did we assume? Total percentage of 35% uh, for low and very low. So it's a fairly high percentage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and actually, this is a good opportunity to talk about the no net loss. So, so if that's exactly what we zone that property for, and if that's exactly what we assume in this document, if Tate comes in and says, well, we can only do 20%, the difference between 20% and 35%, right, in this document, that number of units I have to have in the housing element somewhere else. Now, if we don't have that surplus that Dave had mentioned, then I have to go do, the city has to do a snap rezone within 180 days to find another site. And that's going to be challenging, especially if that does require a vote of the electorate. So hence why we're proposing a 20% uh, um, uh, buffer in the documents. So that's kind of how this would work. Hopefully that helps. All right, thank you. Food for thought. Mr. Lowry? Yeah, I don't know if this is a time to get a little bit more in the weeds or listen to public comments first, but one of the things I noticed was that Sticking a lot of a lot of units in the airport area, especially seems like more of the the low to very low got stuck in the airport area, and it just to me you'd want to diversify those sites out a little bit more amongst the different um, uh, uh, areas that you have marked here. And I mean, you know, uh, uh, Peter brought up uh, Coyote and and uh, Canyon, and understand the limitations with being a landfill and and. I mean, from the land development world, that's a huge money to, to, to put in to make that viable, so I understand that. I, I really just kind of look more to Banning Ranch, and you know, I, I know with the challenges we've had over the years and the, the issues with happened with Coastal, uh, Coastal Commission, but to me, you have vacant land here, and, and, and Jim, I, don't, I, f I forget, sorry, I, just, I forget. Did, is that EIR, did they get vacated on, on Banning Ranch? In other words, what, we did, what was done is gone, or is yes. that? The, the EIR was overturned, and the remedy was to um, um, rescind all approvals. So okay. that EIR is basically dead. So any new project has to start all over from, from square one. So to me, there might be other op new opportunities there. If, if they're going to start over and you have one state agency who, Coastal Commission, that didn't 
approve of this, but you have another state in agency, the HCD, that is 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 wanting these new numbers and and, and putting these these requirements on the cities. It seems to me that 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 may be able to be reworked a little bit to be able to increase uh, increase some of those numbers and maybe be able to spread out spread out. The, the lower, I can say the low to low, low to, to low income mm -hmm. uh, type of um, uh, uh, potential development. It just kind of sticking it in, in, in one area. It doesn't really diversify it. And to me, kind of be able to make it, I guess, uh, coincide with, with the other, say, income levels you have of the different uh, opportunities you have to build there. So that was one of my concerns. I know it was a little bit more in the weeds, but it, it just seemed like that was a, that stuck out pretty pretty uh pretty heavy when i was looking at the graphs i appreciate that comment we we had similar comments um, at the uh, housing element update committee and so we came up with this revised scenario which is attached to your report so we we, we did uh, move them around a little bit tried to better allocate them but we appreciate that comment and we, we will look to that and we'll look again at banny ranch thank you commissioner elmore for the densities how come with the banning ranch you guys applied the the 30 uh, per acre density, whereas in other areas you're up to 45 or 50, considering that it's totally vacant today. Mm -hmm. Well, the airport area, Newport Center, West Newport Mesa, we felt that was an area ripe for densification, you know, especially given their, their proximity to transit and, and proximity to jobs. Uh, um, Dover Westcliff is an area that just is a lower density community there, although the, the Coronado apartments, the 880 apartments, that's 50 dwelling units per acre, if you were curious. Um, why, ban why is it so low at Banning Ranch? Well, we, we have a very limited amount of land to, to work with, actually. I mean, it, it's a 400-acre property, and, and when the Coastal Commission left that site, uh, when it denied the project, they were identifying, you know, it was less than 15 acres of development that was, in essence, free of any environmental constraint. And so, you know, what we're thinking here is, is that 30, uh, we, we, could, we could go a higher density there and, and maybe have a smaller footprint. Um, in reality, we're gonna, we don't know exactly how many acres are out there that we can, that we can use because we don't know how the Coastal Commission is going to react. Are they going to allow us to balance affordable housing production versus you know, environmental constraints on the property? We, we just don't know the answer to that question. So these just seem like reasonable assumptions in that area. Um, we could do a higher assumed density for that property. Um, you know, and, and that one might, might actually reduce its footprint, but then we'd have some quite large buildings in an area that has no building. So it, that was some of our thinking here is just to try to promote compatibility with the community. I just suppose that, uh, you know, the majority of all the other sites with the exception of Coyote Ranch and, and Banning Ranch, um, Coyote Canyon and Banning Ranch are, are really non-contiguous. It's kind of spots. It's you're, you're picking, you're picking different locations here and there and we're applying a number to them. Whereas you have a contiguous site with specifically you know banning and, and, and in theory a, a relatively large contiguous site and so mm -hmm. i look at look at that and in, in the term the, just the idea that it's contiguous and there's probably some really good proper planning that could take place in that zone in the future versus individual specific parcels all over where it would really wasn't planned from that from the beginning so i think my recommendation would be Again, maybe to, to look at potentially de-densifying some of the airport area from the low income and trying to see if we can up the density in the Banning Ranch area. I think it could be done in a more thoughtful in a more thoughtful manner um, that makes it a site that actually prepped for it and and can do it uh, responsibly. So that's my I think my opinion on kind of de-densifying some of this airport area and moving around some of these. So it's just it's it's more equitable throughout the city. Lowry. Curtis, I'm just going to uh, tag on that a little bit. In, in you know, with all of those densities there, I mean, density there in in the airport area there. I mean, you know, we still have, I would say, you know, obviously, Fashion Island and the airport area is kind of our business centers, and we you know we have to be cognizant of that. And, and we don't, you know, Irvine's got a lot of office space there. And we like to keep our businesses here. So just, I just when I see that kind of big numbers there like that, that kind of makes me think a little bit. And, and as Curtis is saying you just look at this open space here and I know it's going to, it's well, there's probably going to be a big fight uh, with, with coastal and all of that going back and forth. But sometimes, you know, you just got to go through that and you, so you have two state agencies telling you what to do. So somebody's got to, I guess it's going to be a, not, not a fun, fun way to do it, but maybe something we have to do. 
I, I wanted to go back to uh, Comm Commissioner Ketting um, and his comments on the uh, um, affordability units. So we have 2,400 low slash very low units that need to be approved. And if you have a developer that only builds 10% of those units affordable, I mean, we'd have to do 24,000 units. And if a developer came in and only did 20%, that would equate to 12,000 more units in the city. So, and then are we including a density bonus into these, you know, units that, that get occurred? I, I think the numbers were a little misinterpreted there. I, I think, I think if you're going to have this buffer for developers, you know, putting in 10% affordable when the rest 90 it gets above, how does that hit arena numbers? Well, the, the above moderate income, as, as, as the table indicates, we've already got enough, you know, projects in the pipeline to meet the upcoming arena need. So we don't actually really need to zone for above moderate. Um, now, when projects are built, they're typically mixed income. You know, if you get 20% uh, inclusion with a density bonus, you've got 80% market rate. And that market rate housing is necessary, if you will, to, in order to make the affordable housing pencil out. And so it's kind of an important component. It's a, it's a component that, that you know, we're not necessarily planning for, but it is an offshoot of how affordable housing is actually financed and built these days. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a response. Most developers won't come in and do higher than 10, 20% affordable because there's no profit in it, right? Typically, they'll come in with the absolute minimum based upon a regulatory standard um, and also an absolute minimum that they can afford. But so, are, there, are there developers out there that could get that number higher? It's possible, yes. And are, yes. Are, is that something we're going to be looking for to you know, try to get those types of well, we, folks we, in the pipeline to discuss? Is that part of this document, part of this it, strategy it, moving forward? It's not really part of the document per se, but you know, let's say an, uh, a nonprofit affordable housing developer might be able to come in and build more because they have a different profit expectation. And so you know, those kinds of projects could be sought. You know, when you start to get to the higher densities, uh, I'm sorry, the higher affordability, they're financed differently. And it's very competitive and, and there's a small amount of, of subsidy that's out there to make those projects work. Um, so we don't en envision having a, a significant amount of those types of projects going forward. Now, now with increases in federal funding and increases in state funding available for the affordable housing production, we may see some additional resources coming and additional production. Dave, did you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, the, the lower income side of the spectrum, they're typically, especially in a high cost market such as Newport, when the dirt cost, if you will, are you know, a, a major driver to that. They're multi-tranche deals, so there's different layering of funding tranches that go on top of that. And there's uh, developers that have specialized in that with the uh, tax credits, among other things. So those are the folks, because they can make the numbers work, they can create the feasible um, pro forma uh, that is appropriate. And so indirectly in the plan, uh, it would um, encourage you to uh, bring those people to the table to accommodate that because really those are the ones that are going to make it happen the private market existing uh, market as it is today just couldn't um, uh, create the subsidy gap there to to do that as you all know yeah yeah i mean i i'd like i, I think the document as is and I, I appreciate all the hard work but i'm afraid it's going to change the character of this community forever so i, I you know i want to look for other strategies to find i I see that the ADUs are listed as 334, uh, the staff report says 336, but um, some people think that there could be more than that. That could be even more aggressive, even though it says aggressive on, on the sheet, I think it could be more aggressive. So I think you know, some strategies need to be applied to that and, and looked on even further. Um, I get it that you know, if you put too much on there, the state's gonna say, how are you gonna you know, enforce that? And um, you, know, you have to have uh, some creative strategies, but I, I think those numbers could in increase yeah. there. Um, some areas too, um, the, the hospital, um, there was the mention when we went through the slide about um, workforce uh, housing. Um, I didn't see anything mentioned about senior housing. Um, so being that it's right next to the hospital, that means the demand on infrastructure is lacking and a lot less than uh, um, if we put it throughout different parts of the city. So if there's an increase in Senior housing, um, I'd love to see that. Now, um, 
I'm not sure where assisted living, congregate care, uh, senior housing, what, what all the differences are. Do they have to have a bedroom, a kitchen, you know, a sink, what, what all it has to have, but we could get creative there and put in a whole host of uh, uh, senior uh, elements. You know, I, I think this Vivante is probably a little extreme. There's not really a, 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 an affordability component to something like that, but I think there are opportunities. Uh, I know that the property here by the dunes has some um, affordable housing in there. So if there could be some, um, increase to that, not just workforce, but also senior. I think that's important because uh, as the document doesn't say, and I thank you for, for mentioning it because that was some of the notes that I had on here is that, you know, it doesn't discuss infrastructure, it doesn't discuss water, sewer, uh, roadways, uh, school fees, uh, school capacities. Uh, there's no development um, fees that are for un units under 50. So, you know, talking about development fees and how that impacts the city, what we're, you know, we're pulling off of. So. I'm looking forward to those being added to, to the discussion later. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's a little premature to do too much on this. I really want to see what the council does uh, moving forward on this. Um, and I'm happy to see that there is a little bit of wiggle, worm, wiggle room um, October 21st versus February um, 22nd. So I think that there's some um, stuff that that could be done beyond that October 21st date. So I understand you want to try to have it in so you're not fine, but I think that since it's in the non-election year, I think council can work through um, beyond that October, that October timeframe. So I, I think that uh, there's more things that can be discussed on here, but I, I do would like to see maybe more discussion on, on senior, senior housing and um, how it equate to uh, assisted living facilities and how that can be uh, how that can be maneuvered because people in Newport Beach that when they get to an age they want to stay in Newport Beach and so that increases the housing stock because say you know Ms. Smith lives on Ford Road but she can't get up to her second story anymore but she wants to live in, in Newport Beach so she can go to the assisted living be in Newport Beach and maybe somebody else could then purchase and be in that house and that's just one example but there could also be people who want to retire in Newport Beach and there could be a, an assisted living or it could be a, a, a Vivante type, but maybe lower income that they could move to Newport Beach and reside and they use less, um, there's less demand on infrastructure. They're not on the roads as much. There might be shuttles. There might be people who go to those locations and work there, but I think the demand on our city services are a lot less when you have seniors. So I, I think that that's a, a big angle that we should be looking at in, in, in further depths. Um, that's an astute observation, especially given the age of our community. So, you know, that, that kind of dovetails with the community characteristics. We have an older community and, and allowing them to, re, you know, to move into that type of housing. That's then and typically senior housing is a little more welcomed in the community. And, you know, the baby senior housing project was fairly well welcomed to the community back in 2003. Yeah. And the only other area that was more on a finite scale was the map on the um, airport area that showed the front nine of the Newport Beach golf course. Mm -hmm. That was an area I, I just, I wanna say that when I would drive by there in the pandemic, that area has so much more use. There's so many, so much demand for recreation. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned that, you know, removing something like that for our residents is, is ill, to me, ill-advised because that's something that our residents take advantage of. They might not be able to afford to go to, uh, you know, some of our nicer courses, but they can afford to go to something like that, and that's a good recreation. So I, I get concerned when I see recreation being removed because that's, you know, once that's once that's cement or concrete, that's never going to come back to being green. So I get concerned with with issues like that. Um, but uh, I, I think we should slow so pump the brakes a little on this. I'm 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 glad that there's been such diligent work and. Look, we have to adhere to what the state wants, what the state's throwing down on this. But as a taxpayer of this city, I'm, I'm willing to spend whatever tax dollars possible to fight something like this. And I'm sure there's a host of residents that would agree with me on this. So I don't want to see the face and the character of the city being changed over, over uh, uh, trying to meet this demand that's arbitrary, in my opinion. So and it's just, that's my, my personal thought. One quick question, Jim. You know, on these matrix? Yes. Okay. It started on site 17. What happened to 1 through 16? 
I think ones through 16 are in a different table at the back. And Wait a minute. one through 16 is actually on page B37 of the document. So a little further back. Sorry. And those are the list of moderate income sites. And I, th I think we're missing right. a few sites, but I think we discussed that, Dave. So there's going to be an update to that. But the, the, the first 16 are these moderate it. income sites. Understood. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other commissioner question? Commissioner Kleiman. I just have kind of one more comment. I mean, I, I would mirror the concerns of, of our chair. I, um, I, too, am very concerned about this changing the character of our city, um, particularly going forward without having some reassurances, some, you know, restrictions and protections in place. But I understand that this is um, a bit of a game, if you will, that we have to play and um, we have to kind of move the process forward. Um, a game's probably not the right word as I see your reaction. Um, but my other concern is is the next phase, right? That we want to be thinking ahead and that we don't want uh, to overdo it, right? We want to make sure that we have a, a maximum number that we're hitting and that we don't then put ourselves in a category where we're catapulted. I mean, this number came out of the blue to us, especially uh, relative to what the last cycle was, what, like five units? Yeah, we had five. Um, I, I, the big issue was the state decided to just give us the entire region 1.3 million, and we were hopeful that it was going to be under 500,000. So that was the, the big change that made the, all the numbers inflated. Right. But so I guess my concern is if we if we miss the target, you know, and we overshoot by quite a bit with these overlays, particularly with projects that we don't want, you know, with projects that are going to have these density bonuses and they're going to have other, um, you know, site development reviews expedited and things that we're gonna, we're gonna miss opportunities to really refine those the way we typically would. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to have these projects we have to live with and all of the burdens that come with those. And then the next cycle we get hit with that times X, whatever that looks like. So it, it's impossible to speculate what the next cycle will be. But with this legislature, um, with all the housing bills that you're seeing coming through, you know, we obviously expect more change on top of this. Um, you know, it, I think it might be important to note that, you know, the city council is looking for, you know, you know, they're, they're, they've got a housing action plan. We've been sponsoring legislation to kind of make this a little simpler process and kind of push back against the state. And those are the policy decisions the council is considering. What council asked us to do as an option to all of that is to come up with a plan to comply. And that's what we're doing here. Um, you know, staff and, and, the, and the committee, we all, and, and the public, I don't think anyone wants to do this. And yes, this, if, if, if built to these levels, you know, it, it is gonna change the face of the community over time. It won't happen overnight but it is a bit transformative. And so, you know, we share your concern, um, but the council's asked us to come up with a plan to comply as it, you know, because ultimately at the end, we believe we may be forced to comply. And the council is looking at other legislative matters and, and looking at other issues to try and push back against the state. And it's a, it's a, it's a challenging um, 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 issue for the, for the council and for every community in, in, in the state. So we're all in this together, let's say. All right, seeing no commissioner questions, I'll open the public hearing and um, I'll first remind the public of the phone number is 949-270-8165 to call in and I'll go to public comments with Mr. Mosier here in the community or here in the council chambers. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Weigand. Uh, my name again is Jim Mosier. I, I guess I'm a little surprised with all the public outreach that I'm the only one here tonight. Hopefully there'll be more on the phone. I have a number of comments. Uh, first, first, with regard to zoning overlays, they, they may sound good, but as I'm sure you understand, the traditional purpose of zoning is not only to provide development opportunities, but also to pr protect property owners from what their neighbors can do. And strange as it may seem, I believe there are people that might not be thrilled by themselves and their neighbors being overlaid. They might be in an office park 
and not want it to turn into residential, so they may not want to be next to that. So it may not be universally uh, cheered. Uh, second, I'm concerned about the assurances we have that this is just an initial draft. It's kind of a trial balloon we're sending to the state. Nothing is set in concrete. My understanding is after we ask for the 60-day review, uh, HCD is going to provide comments. They're expecting us to address those comments and not really do much else. So if we went off in some other direction and adopted something totally different than they had reviewed, I'm not sure that that's going to go well. So I, I share your chair's concern and some of your others about the schedule. We're running headlong towards this adoption on October 15th to avoid penalties, but the staff report is telling us now and reminding us there's actually a four-month grace period. So there really is no penalty if the council adopts it by February 15th of next year, meaning perhaps we don't have to get the draft in so soon. The statutory requirement is only that the draft be submitted 60 days before the adoption by the council. I can understand you would not want to go beyond January 1st with the adoption, I think, because on January 1st, who knows what new housing laws may have emerged, and a element adopted after January 1st might be invalidated by that new legislation, for all I know. Uh, but I'm not sure why we're shooting for October and not December for the adoption. Um, and another thing I'm concerned about is on handwritten page eight of the staff report. It's telling us about the schedule, reminding us the city council is gonna review this on April 27th. And the sentence after that says, following the study session, staff will request city council authorization to submit a revised draft after considering public comments to date to HCD for the review. I have trouble decoding what the sentence means. It is, does that mean on a date after that at a future council meeting? Is the council, is the public actually going to see the draft that is being sent to HCD? In past housing element cycles, the public and the council got to see that and actually authorize what is being submitted. I would hope that is the case again. Uh, I guess my time is up. I have more comments, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Uh, I'm guessing that this means after everything's reviewed or and sent to the state, 60 days is what they'll give us to to work on, or they'll take 60 days to process it. Yeah, the state will take 60 days to review it. They're required to submit any deficiencies, if you will, to us, and then they're expecting us. Mr. Mosier, correct? They would expect us to address those in some way, and so. He is right, we, we really don't wanna deviate wildly from the plan that we have here, but we can fine tune the plan, we can fine tune some sites, as long as it still meets those objectives. You know, we can tweak the policies and add what the state requires us to do, because they're, they're looking at it from a checklist of compliance for state law. And so if we've missed something or something needs to be clarified, then we'll have to add that. Do you think the state has the manpower to handle this, you know, the, this, 60 days it's going to take them to review. I mean, how many municipalities are there in the state that, or at least in this um, zone for SCAG that has to adhere to this? Uh, you know, and, and then when you do have to remedy, you know, there's a, you said there is a, a period of time they ha we have to remedy if they have concerns. You know, how, how responsive are these guys going to be? You know, uh, I, I just can't see them. Th that seems like a lot of legwork when you have all these municipalities having the same struggles. And I think Newport Beach is far beyond the curve of, of some of these other cities. I think Newport is as being as aggressive on this as possible. And I think that's smart and wise because it shows the state that we're trying to comply. Um, as or other cities, I don't think are, are nearly as advanced on this. But you know, I, I don't see the state. The state can't even process EDD claims, let alone <laughs> um, you know this department. So I, 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 I you know go to the DMV. Is it going to work that well for all these municipalities? I, I, it's one, it's one of those things they're good at taking, but not maybe as good at giving. Um, the statutorial de statutorial sixty day deadline, and uh, I don't think of I can't think of one occasion ever that they've missed that deadline so they have the resources and 
you know, there may be some strategies in terms of the depth of, of their responses to that, but they are obligated by law within 60 days uh, to provide a response to that. And so essentially they have to show your car, their cards to you in 60 days of, of what complies. Um, the idea being is uh, within that 60 days, uh, the city is afforded time to negotiate or have the conversation. So it doesn't go into black box necessarily. There is open dialogue and it's traditional that uh, within a, a number of weeks before that 60 day deadline, the city will have an opportunity to change or edit the document to suffice to uh, what they uh, what the recommended changes are. So they will, um, if they don't have the resources, they'll find the resources to ensure that they follow that 60 day deadline initially. Yep. They'll just hire more government workers for the state. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we have some phone calls, right? Okay. Pipe them in. Okay, you're on. If you could please mute your television. Uh, yes, I did. This is Deborah Allen. I am the president of the Harborview Hills Community Association. Um, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen and learn about the site plane ordinance. Um, I trust that you're hearing me because um, I'm, I'm watching. I've, I've muted my TV, my computer, but I still see staff talking. So Yes, there's am, just a, am I a delay. You're good. You, we hear you. Oh, okay, good. Okay, fine. Um, I just want to address a couple of issues. Um, you all know from the emails that you've received from me and others in the community, there's about 146 homes in my association, plus the two Broadmoor associations that are all protected by this. That's another 100 homes. So you're looking at about 700 people that have relied on this site plane ordinance since the 60s when the tracks were built. Um, it, it is a constraint on the property. We wanted to bring it to your attention early. Uh, if it's more appropriate to actually put it into development standards uh, that come along later, that's fine. But we simply want a recognition from the city that this is a constraint, a longstanding constraint on the site. Um, it's important if I could mention something um, that was referenced by, uh, by Commissioner Ketting, um, it, whether there's been people who've responded to the city's invitation to this um, uh, overlay residential dwelling zone. And yes, there are five sites uh, under the site plan uh, that are listed in your, um, in your table B10 that have expressed interest in, in redeveloping as residential. Um, three of those are right along uh, Pacific Coast Highway. So uh, we are clearly concerned. There are almost 1,000, if uh, based on the density, um, underneath the site plane, there are 1,000 dwelling units proposed um, for the uh, overlay. There are 7,200 uh, dwelling units proposed for the zoning overlay throughout Newport Center, and about 10,000 more at the airport, about 20,000, I think, citywide. So, um, yes, the staff really rightfully assumes that a lot, a lot of people will not take up that offer to redevelop. But once you place that overlay zone on uh, 7,200 units in Newport Center or 10,000 units in, uh, in the airport, I, I, I think you might have some problems getting rid of it. Um, so I just want you to keep that in mind as you go along. Anyway, beyond that, I think that uh, Deputy Director Campbell made an excellent summary of what the site plane ordinance is. I'm pleased that you listened and that you recognize that it is a constraint on the property. I appreciate the materials that um, that Jim Campbell provided to you, and um, we're here to answer any questions. Oh, one last thing. Um, the reason I'm not there in person is because I was under the impression that I couldn't be. Oh, sorry. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Yes, staff, um, I, I'm very supportive of what she's saying, so I don't know if that's something we have to handle tonight or if that's something you just send to the council on, but you know, I, I want to I protect what has been put in place. It's, it's one of the few instances in the city that does this, and uh, I think their concerns are absolutely legitimate, and I want the council to know on my end that I support that, but you know, obviously this commission's got other members, so that, that's my personal. Thank you, Chair Reagan. We will make sure that the council is fully aware of the site plan ordinance. Great, thank you. All right, next Can caller, I, please. Chair, oh, quickly. You, yeah. Over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Kleiman. Just quickly, while we're on that subject, I'm just curious uh, if this document, as it's written, would supersede that ordinance, or if it's something that, as uh, as we talked about earlier, would sort of be deferred to this next phase of of document that we were talking about where we get into uh, site restrictions and, and development standards. Certainly, so this document, which is the housing element, will not supersede the ordinance. It's all gonna come back to um, what are the design standards that will get adopted. As Deputy Director Jim Campbell talked about, it is those development standards that we need to plan for, the zoning we need to plan for. So that is going to be a discussion with the city council. I've heard from the city council that they have no intention of removing that site plan ordinance. They want to preserve it. So then the, then the burden is going to be on the developer to develop the density that they're looking for at the same time um, meeting that site plan ordinance. That means they're restricted on the height. So as it was mentioned, we, they can maybe recess the building a little bit or depress the building, or maybe they can't hit the density that they're looking for. Okay, so as it's drafted, as it stands, if it goes forward and it's approved, uh, that site plan ordinance does not go away. Those residents do not lose their protections. That is correct. Okay, just wanted to make sure because I, um, I concur. I absolutely agree with the uh, chair. Thank you. Next caller, please. Okay, you're on. Good evening, Chair Wagan and Commissioners. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy Scarborough. Um, I, I'm sorry to <laughs> call again. I think I've spoken at every Planning Commission meeting on this and every Housing Element Workshop and every Housing Commission meeting. So um, I have to say that um, this document is, uh, it, it, we don't have a deadline of December or of uh, October. We have a deadline probably closer to December. It's a very complicated document. There's a lot of work that's gone into it, and I think that it is important that everyone understands that, including all of you and all of the city council. I know I've got 500 hours into this in my own um, experience and, and learning curve, and I'm still learning things. So there are more things that need to be done here. I think that we should be talking to some of these affordable housing developers to find out whether they can do densities at a higher than 10% affordable and 90% um, above market or market so that we can make the right decisions. It's so important that we get this right before we send a draft to the state because once we send that, there is no, no backtracking. We're not gonna claw back anything that we tell them is a possible option. So I just really encourage you to um, relay that sentiment to the council and um, allow everybody to have time to think about this and breathe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller, please. Okay, you're on. Hi, this is uh, John Loper. I am uh, here on behalf of the family that owns uh, the Alito Plaza at um, the Alito and Newport Boulevard. And we have a couple comments on the housing plan. Uh, the addresses are 3415 to 3475 the Alito. Um, which is the West Marine Plaza and also the home of the Lido Theater. Um, we are requesting that uh, the city um, um, provide a mixed-use zoning overlay on uh, this property, uh, the Lido Plaza property. We have participated back in 2019 in a workshop and mentioned it and have sent a subsequent letter here when the draft first came out in March about uh, this. But we believe this would be a good site to uh, allow some residential use um, retail is changing with the rise of e-commerce and the effects on retailers that 
uh, that COVID has provided and the large amount of surface parking that this center has, we think that this is uh, right for a potential redevelopment. And we're surrounded on um, multiple sides by zoning that was put in place uh, in the fifth round, the previous round, um, including mixed-use zoning W2 on the north, mixed-use CV15 on the south, mixed-use vertical on the east, and the planning community 59 on the east, which is a townhome development. So we request that the Planning Commission consider the option of having um, this particular parcel included in um, a residential uh, overlay zone as all of the surrounding properties had already been included in a residential mixed-use overlay, uh, overlay zone in the previous round. And I'm available for any questions. Great, thank you so much. Staff, um, was that area uh, looked at uh, at all? Was it was there an oversight? Is it have an affordability component that can be added? Is that why it wasn't in, intended? Is there a way that we can just have council or have the next you know step at least mm -hmm. look at it and talk to these individuals to uh, to determine if they're interested in any affordability towards it? Well, certainly, um, you know, this site was not looked at because it was not uh, mixed use in the fifth cycle. Um, you know, it is a commercial property. We were not looking to densify the, 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 the peninsula area. Um, it is a shopping center area, and, you know, it, it might affect the viability of the commercial in the area. So it really wasn't a site that we were looking for. Uh, we were, again, kind of led by the community and the, and the Housing Element Update Committee to look at the areas that are the focus areas that are in the draft here today. And so. Um, this is the first outreach that we've had uh, recently in a, with some letters um, last week um, by the property owner. And we'll have that dialogue with the property owner to see if it's a viable site. And, you know, maybe the council might consider including it. I don't know. Great. I appreciate that. Yes, just uh, sure. reach out to them. That would be helpful. Okay, next caller. Nope, no more callers. All right. I'll close the uh, public hearing and bring it back to the uh, commission for any further, further discussion, maybe based on thoughts you might have. Uh, that you missed or thoughts that were mentioned during public comment? Commissioner Kenny. Yes, uh, staff, at some point, Coastal Commission is going to have to go down the hall in Sacramento to HCD and say, hey, this Banning Ranch thing, uh, we've got to make a deal or something. I mean, they, otherwise, and it's probably going on any coastal community that... The Coastal Commission deny, 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 and then HCDC says build up density, build up density. Mm -hmm. Is that going to happen, or is this going to have to go to the politicians? Well, what I would say is that the Coastal Commission is more amenable today than they have been ever for housing in the coastal zone. You know, it's, it's the lowest, it's not a priority use for the coastal zone at all. You know, they tolerate it, so to speak. They, they, they're actually, they want to see the preservation of existing density today. And so they have kind of changed their mindset because they are recognizing that we have a, a, a we're in a housing crisis. Um, the, the environmental justice policy that the Coastal Commission has recently adopted suggests, you know, that they exercise that, those principles in their review. And so, you know, housing and affordable housing, principally affordable housing in the coastal zone, seems like an environmental justice issue. So, Will the Coastal Commission be amenable to affordable housing in the coastal zone? I think that they will. Um, whether or not they're going to allow it on Banning Ranch, I don't know. There are environmental constraints there, and how they weigh those issues is really that agency's purview. Um, are they going to compromise their principles on environmental preservation for affordable housing? We don't know. We haven't seen a case like that yet. We have spoken to the Coastal Commission staff so that they know that we're looking at this site. Um, we didn't get a lot of definitive feedback from them, so that's about all I have for you there. So hopefully that answers your question. And Commissioner Lowry? Yeah, what are the notations in there, on at least on the uh, kind of financing side of it, as these mortgage revenue bonds from the county? Has that been used much? Have you, have you seen that much? used in, in Newport Beach in, in terms of trying some of these more, you know, very low, low income type of developments or is that, I just read that and just, there wasn't much to it, but you know, it might not be used that much, but I was interested. To... It, 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 it was used for the, um, um, the Uptown Newport project to help finance okay. that. So the city was uh, assisted in that, uh, that endeavor. So it, it is used. And so I would anticipate it to be used in the future. I've seen other things too, where you're seeing a large amount of state dollars and maybe federal dollars are tied to that too for say homeless moving into some more of that very low 
uh, uh, you know, very low income housing is to kind of get back on their feet is, have you seen that type of action here or any of that type of or action, but poss possibilities here? Is that, is that part of the mix as you see in terms of when you see the financing of these? I'm just, as, as it was alluded to several times, it's just kind of the, and, and I get it where you're coming from. This is this is a planning document, and it's up to the private sector for financing. But I just some of this seems that it's a very big reach to get to the other side. I think on a, on a number of these from a from a private sector point of view, and just kind of thinking how 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 that's how that gap is yeah. is met, and the, the bonds just came up, and I just you know it was one of the questions, and some of the dollars it seems that's going into trying to get people back on their feet, if that's part of the mix as well. Yeah, the, the document does have policies that, you know, we have to provide opportunities for shelters and we have to provide opportunities for homeless and, and the city is uh, partnering with the city of Costa Mesa to provide some beds so that we can, um, uh, you know, assist the, that population as well. And so those are uh, those are supportive policies in the housing element. But you're right, there is a big leap to try to, to get from one side of, of planning for it and then actually executing it where, where you know, affordable housing doesn't, doesn't get, get created. There's a cost there and you're leaving revenue on the table and so it doesn't pencil out most times. So, so there are a variety of financing techniques um, and you know, we do see additional funds coming from the state and federal government that will help spur affordable housing development. Are we gonna see a lot here in Newport Beach? Well, we will see some. Um, um, you know, are, are, we, are we gonna see more of it in a faster rate? Probably. Um, to the extent that we see uh, these opportunities, absolutely not. We don't see that occurring. Um, I guess the point I was gonna make is that, um, um, eh, I missed, I, I lost my train of thought. I apologize, sir. Okay, good. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Klostermeyer. I'll just make one comment, um, echoing, I think, some of your concerns, Chair Weigand. Um, looking at all of these different planning areas, there's a pretty low percentage that are projected to redevelop. Um, that may or may not be realistic, but there are certainly a large number of parcels that we are contemplating putting an overlay on, and we're going to have to live with that for this whole next cycle. So I think we need to be very diligent in uh, the manner in which we're approaching this. One thing I want to add, if I may, uh, we're, we're looking at this overlay as providing, you know, an overlay to a large area for, for the affordable housing and, and housing, obviously. Um, but, but it would be available to, to meet the need that you're seeing. And so it wouldn't be available forever. It, you know, as soon as we met the need and we, we have enough sites to meet the, the unaccounted need over time, then it wouldn't, it, it, would, it would actually stop. And so, you know, but, but will we actually get that level of production where it would actually go away? I'm not entirely sure. But we, it, we, we wouldn't want to create an overlay that just is there in perpetuity and then we'd have all the units that would be, so there would be caps. So when you look at the, the policies, there's a target number of units that we're looking for there. And so once we reach that target, it goes away. That, that's our concept of the, for the overlay. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Any other commissioner? I, I just wanted to go on to next steps. Um, has staff thought about on the next steps adding a member of this commission to the committee that discusses things going forward, or is it really just going to go to planning commission? You know, is the housing element committee done, or are they going back? Uh, it, well, the I, the only reason why I say is sometimes I feel like if we have one bod member of this body over on that committee as well, they can kind of report back to us so that you know, there's a little bit more understanding. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys watched the, the tapes of the or the meetings of the Housing Element Committee, but if you're not watching them, then when it comes to us, we're just given this giant packet and Commissioner Ketting's got some good time on his hands. But, you know, sometimes we're, we're all volunteers, <laughs> so it just depends on the week how much time we have to, to review it for that upcoming. So with this, you know, I think we all kind of hit the grind on this and did a fabulous job. And I appreciate the commissioner's feedback on this and, and comments. But let, let's just say there was an off week and we didn't get a chance to review. It would be nice to kind of have some periodic updates um, when this gets further, closer to when we're going to be voting on it. So I'm, sure. I, and, and I'm not suggesting you have to do it, but maybe entertain that thought uh, and, and peeling one of us off on that. If there's you know, time available for any of commissioners to do, I'm not sure. I might be speaking on their behalf. Sure. sure. Um, you know, the, the committee's going to go basically on hiatus until we get the comments back from HCD, and we, we intend to have a meeting in August for them. 
Um, you know, to change the composition of the committee would require council action. Um, we haven't had those conversations with, with um, anyone in that regard, but I, but I think the commissioners can volunteer and, and, and actually participate in the meetings, and so you can actually then you know hear what's going on, and so if that's meaningful, we can provide more advanced notice. Um, and, and we can do uh, you know an additional workshop for the commission as we get that back. So we're not just compartmentalizing with with one group. We can actually maybe do both at the same time. And so we can look for those opportunities to get great. you more involved in the next up round of review. Perfect. That's great. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, I'll close that discussion on unless anyone has any further. Okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate Thank again you. staff's hard work and. Uh, the committee, the housing element committee, is a, a fabulous job. It's a lot of work, and 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 we all are, are grateful for that. Appreciate that, chair. Okay, moving on to staff and commissioner items. Any motions for consider reconsideration? Seeing none. Um, report uh, by the community development director or request for matters which planning commission member would like placed on a future agenda. Jim. Sure, I'll do a brief report here for you. Um, on, on March 23rd, the City Council met and they did consider, they did adopt the, the wine tasting ordinance, so it was second reading, so that's um, been completed. Um, they did authorize the general plan update progress report that you reviewed earlier in the month, um, and so that was submitted to the state uh, uh, on or before April 1st. Um, one issue of note, which actually doesn't really uh, come to us, but I just want to let you know that the council did approve a one-year waiver of business license fees for businesses that were forced to close due to the COVID emergency. So I thought that was noteworthy. Um, so April, April 5th, we did have a, a virtual workshop for the circulation element. We got some really good feedback there. I wasn't going to summarize that. Uh, we, we don't have a, a future city council study session on that planned, um, um, but uh, we'll look to create some additional opportunities for, for, uh, for input. So in the next planning commission meeting on April 22nd, we don't have any items, so we're gonna have a meeting off, so uh, you're welcome. Um, the following meeting on May 6th, we've got a full agenda. We've got basically four items, a uh, small veterinary clinic, a small restaurant. Uh, we have tattoo establishments, so we're looking at updating that ordinance. Um, and we have a study session on a residential project here in Newport Center that we're gonna present to you. Um, so for the next uh, city council meeting, we're gonna be, as we've indicated, we're taking the housing element to them for their review and input. And um, we hope to get through that process and then submit it as we've indicated. Um, so the, the other item will be there, uh, but the big item on that agenda for the city council will be the Mariner's Mile mixed use project that you reviewed and approved in February. So that's gonna come forward on the April 27th meeting of the city council. So that's my report, and if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Great, thanks, Jim. Commissioner Kenny. Oh. Uh, you can take those. Um, so, so real briefly, you know, we've had that revised scenario that was in the packet, and we're gonna be updating all of this for the city council, so there's going to be a, an updated version of this for the city council um, for, the, for the upcoming meeting. So, but you're welcome to have that. The, the text won't change too much, but the numbers will. Any commissioner requests for items? Uh, the public want to comment on the report? Okay, I'll move to uh, item number six, request for excuse. Sure. Sorry, Mr. Moja, did you want to? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Wigan. I, I actually wanted to comment on that last comment from Commissioner Ketting. It, it sounds like you received paper copies of the housing element to review. Uh, the city staff mentioned some of the noticing was old school, that it was published in the newspaper. I think people have a different feel and perception sometimes when they see things printed out than when they're watching them on a screen. Our current housing element I don't think is printed anywhere and I don't know if staff's concept is this new housing element general plan will be a totally online virtual document, but it would be really helpful, I think. Or if the public is being asked to review it, actually there'd be paper copies somewhere that people can look at. Could be at the libraries. Unfortunately, currently the libraries don't let people sit down. So not quite sure how you work that out. Perhaps at the city hall, there should be a printed out copy. People can come and look at. I think, think it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. And I'll move to item six, a request for excused absences from the commission. 
Seeing none, I will adjourn our meeting. Thank you.